Good morning, Douglas County. Greetings. My name is Kelly Robinson, the Commissioner of the 2nd District, and Vice Chair of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. Welcome to the 6th Annual uh, HOA Boot Camp. We've got a pretty good agenda that we've got set today, and I just, just by way of just so everybody knows, we've got a classroom here and we've got one online, so this is a hybrid model. But this is not a, a talking head, this is not a speech moment and stuff, this is about information. And so being the sixth annual, we've gotten to a place where we know, we've learned, we've heard what the citizens are important to them. But why would we do this? As a legislator, why would I advance in a, an event like this? Well, there's a couple things. Um, as a legislator, my job is to regulate, to check and balance the administration. But when I can't regulate, I educate. We use this platform to educate the citizens on certain matters that may be beyond my pay grade. Uh, we're gonna get into the HOAs a little bit later on, but that's regulated by the state. But of course, you know, we have a job to play at the local level. We do things that we can to advance it. In addition, we try to give information that's important for you to sort of live your life in a positive way. So we're gonna jump right into this in just a minute. I've got two panels that are gonna be coming. The first one is gonna talk about general county, general things in the housing market. We know that's important. Uh, what a ride in the past year. And I'm sure we're gonna get some very insightful information here over the uh, next hour or so. In addition, the second part, uh, right around the 10 o'clock hour, we're going to have um, a second panel to get deeper into the HOAs, the things that are unique to that. And we designed it this way because, again, it's about going broad and going deep. But again, it's about information. And what I've learned over the past 14 years is, you know, citizens just want to be informed. You know, I I'm sure my citizens at home, they're making their Cheerios for the kids and doing the things that are necessary. Um, likewise, while we're here, in, um, in, uh, we're at what I want to call the Activity Center of Boundary Waters, a very beautiful center. So if you haven't been there yet, you need to come on out here. But with that being said, I'm going to just jump right into this because I don't want to go long. You know, this is, I've, I've got more of a, an educator hat on today. You know, not trying to, you know, persuade you, really just trying to inform you. But again, this is important. You know, the topics that we take up, you know, for example, um, small businesses are important. So in January, it's important to highlight that. Mental health is important in May. We highlight that, the things that matter. But one of the things with the HOAs that I noticed over the past, um, I want to say, six years is that there's some behavior within the HOAs that need to be addressed. Um, there's some behavior within the HOAs, both from a leadership and the citizenry. So think about taxpayers. Think about like we pay our taxes, and we expect those people that we elected to go and take care of the business. That's a part of the people's agenda. Well, somewhere, away, somewhere along the way to Grandma's house, um, you, you began to get people in leadership within the HOAs that um, went in a direction I, 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 can't, I could not believe was happening. Um, you have people who are on boards that don't have elections. Now, think about if Douglas County didn't have election. Um, there was no provision of, of financials to know how the money was actually spent on an annual basis. I mean, that's stuff that gets you in trouble. Um, and it's something that it, it was just, and I'm stunned. And don't get me wrong, some HOAs are very well run. Very well run. And then some of them need a little help, a little bit more education. Uh, you have people who come into leadership who have maybe some type of corporate experience, and, and, and so they're able to be a leader. But yet, they're using it for power versus to really serve. You know, those who get those titles, are you here to serve? Or you hit it, you know, really, is it about the power? And I saw when you start putting these liens on people's property because they're not paying their, their tech, their, their dues and so forth, and there's a, there, we get it, I understand, you pay your dues, and if you're late, we understand that. But, but it was an overthrottling that I was seeing. It's like, ooh, you're not giving out information, you can move on people's assets, you don't have regular meetings, you don't have meeting minutes, and we're neighbors. Just, what, two days ago, uh, one of my citizens says, yeah, we, we were supposed to have, in District 2, we were supposed to have a, a meeting the day before. They didn't have, because they didn't have a quorum. And we were supposed to be electing officers. Now, how are you going to do that? You don't, the officer don't take this serious? I've only missed three meetings in 14 years. Two times I had to get on the table with my eyes, and one time I was sick. I don't miss meetings. So if you're going to do this, you've got to do it right. The other thing about the HOA is that, again, you're regulating yourself at a local level. It's a covenant. I get it. It's a constitution. We get to cover it. It's just like a constitution. So you agree when you came in there and you signed your name that you're going to be bound by this. You can regulate yourself. It's sort of like a commission or a council within your, your community. 
but there is a standard to this. This pin I wear, it's a standard. I had to go get educated. That's what this is about, right? Just to, to inform you to get you down a path, say, hey, there's more to this if you're gonna do it right. You don't want people to call it empathetic. You, know, you don't want them to become critical, all that HOA, all that, you know, because again, you, are, you do have to pay your dues, but those who are sitting in them seats, are they, are they acting righteous? You know, and, and it, it burns me. It's like, wow, that's stuff I go jail for. For real, the behavior I see, I'm like, wow, but y'all are neighbors, like, wow. So again, it's one of those where we took this up to the state, um, and I'll, I'll finish my closing comments. I work with um, William Bodie um, Jr. He's currently run, running for labor commissioner, but he also was um, House Representative of the 62nd District, Team Fulton. And so we advanced the bill probably about three or four times up through the General Assembly, couldn't quite get traction. We had Senator John Della James, the 35th. Um, she also helped provide support. Um, couldn't quite get there as well. They're gonna give us an update a little bit later on today. But it's one of those like, okay, because it's regulated at the state level. It's like, come on guys, and there's a part of this about developers. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the second half. But it was just one of those where, ooh, you know, I, I couldn't get there. Now there are some things that we could do at a local level, and Allison, we're, we're Duncan, our staff, we'll cover it a little bit later on. Uh, we did hear you last year, and we did enact some legislation at the local level regarding controls. But some of this is, um, it, it just, we, we can do better. It needs to be reformed. But that being said, I just want to set up the atmosphere. Uh, we're good to go. Uh, we're going to go ahead and jump right into this with my very first speaker. Um, and this is going to be the housing part. The first part of this housing, the second part is the HOA. So with no further ado, Ivy, can you introduce our first speaker, please? Good morning. Our first speaker is Allison Duncan. AICP is the Planning and Zoning Manager in Douglas County, Georgia. She has undertaken planning projects in the communities around Metro Atlanta with a focus on preservation and conservation, planning, comprehensive planning, and strategic planning. Ms. Duncan has worked in private, public, and nonprofit organizations. Previously, as a planner in the city of South Fulton, Georgia, the Community Development Group of Atlanta, Regional Commission, ECOS Environmental Design, and Morgan County, Georgia. She began her career working with the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservations at the organization's flagship property in Macon, Georgia. Ms. Duncan has a bachelor's de degree from Mercer University, a master's degree in historic preservation from the University of Georgia, Community volunteer contributions include the City of Atlanta, of Chattahoochee Hills Historic Commission, Historic Oakland Cemetery Garden Guild, and Truly Living Well Center for Natural Urban Agriculture. Please welcome Allison Duncan. Thank you. Thank you, Ivy, and thank you, Commissioner Robinson. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to share this information with you. Um, I'd like to thank my fellow panelists and thank everybody um, who is here with us today in person and also like to thank our citizens who are here online. Um, I'm going to take a moment today and share some information with you about our comprehensive plan update. We are just kicking that comprehensive plan update off. Um, and so I want to start there and talk about how through that process um, we're going to have the opportunity to take a deep dive into learning a little bit more about our housing um, characteristics that we have here in Douglas County. So I hope this lays a good foundation for the conversation that we plan to have together today. Uh, so let's do I have a presentation. Great, thank you. All right. So I've been starting with this, um, with this slide when I talk about our comprehensive plan update. Um, and you may say, why is she showing us a map from 1975? Um, but the map that you see from 1975 is one of the, the oldest maps that I've been able to find for a comprehensive planning process that substantially looks like the way we do planning today. Um, and the other map is our current future land use map that we're operating off of today. And I think that this is an important point to pause here and to just share uh, for, the, for the greater good of the community this idea that through this plan update that we're working on now, we will cross that 50-year threshold of doing long-range planning in Douglas County. And I think that's a really important milestone, and I think it's a great opportunity to kind of look at where we've been as we think about where we're going moving forward. Um, so the plan update that we're embarking on now is going to kind of cross into that 2025 
um, time frame, and so it'll give us a good opportunity to look back at this 1975 map um, and just see how far we've come. Oops, too fast. Okay, um, so what I'm sharing with you now is our current uh, future land use map. Um, we talk a lot about character areas when we do future land use map planning. Um, and any time we look at how we're going to be doing land use changes, we want to make sure that we're voting with our future land use map. So this map is something that, that characterizes all of our land use in the county based on different categories, whether we want residential, commercial, um, industrial development in the county. Um, so as part of our comprehensive plan update, this is a great opportunity for citizens to get involved and tell us what you would like to see in your community particularly as it relates to housing. It's going to be a great opportunity for folks to get involved, you know, to say this is where we need to see some higher density housing, this is where we want to preserve our stable single family neighborhoods, you know, and to really help us understand what the needs are for the community. Now, in addition to the, the future land use, to that parcel by parcel classification of whether something should be residential, commercial, or industrial, We've also heard your feedback that we want, that we need to be doing a better job of planning for the context um, in which that development is happening. So what I'm showing you here behind me is a draft of the character areas that we hope to develop as a part of this comprehensive plan update. You know, we sort of have an idea, big picture, that like if you're in Lithia Springs, right, we know that that's one of the oldest developed parts of Douglas County. So we know that your housing stock is going to have very specific characteristics based on the time frame in which it was developed. You know, we know that if you're kind of out in the western part of Douglas County, you know, your housing stock is going to look very different because you fall under those protections of the Dog River watershed, and that demands that housing is a little bit larger and more spread out, right? And so we've heard you say that you need to do a better job, you know, planning for the context and the character of where different development types are. So I share this with you to say, I think this is one of the most exciting pieces for me that's gonna be coming out of our comprehensive plan update, but it's really critical that we get the feedback from the community as we refine these boundaries, you know, to make sure that we're looking appropriately at the different characteristics. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that means. So I'm showing you here an example of some of the preliminary work that we've been doing, and this is from around the Lithia Springs area. Uh, we worked with a, with a steering committee, you know, between our last comprehensive plan update and the one that we're just starting on now, to say, tell us a little bit more detail about what's going on in your community, right? So we're still going to have those basic future land use categories. We're still going to look parcel by parcel at what we want to see going on on the ground, but we're also going to make sure that we're planning for sort of the bigger community cohesion right, for how all of those specific uses, you know, work together. We're also going to look at some of the other planning initiatives that we've been working on, such as the South Douglas Scenic Byway. Um, that was another initiative that we had undertaken, you know, since the last comprehensive plan update. Again, we worked with the citizens and we came up with a plan for the area along the State Route 92-166 corridor um, to designate that as, as a scenic byway corridor. And that means that we're going to plan for a variety of different types of of land use and particularly housing um, in that area to look very differently than it may in other parts of the county. So we're going to make sure that we take all of this good planning work and we're going to try to put it together in our comprehensive plan update. Uh, I'm very excited to report that the commissioners have also given us resources to focus on two other small area studies as a part of our comprehensive plan update. Um, so kind of in the Winston area on the west side of Douglasville, uh, between Douglasville and Villa Rica. So we're going to be doing some small area planning there, looking at a variety of land uses, including industrial, commercial, civic, and housing, you know, and kind of doing a deeper dive in this area to make sure that we kind of understand the future growth patterns um, for this part of Douglas County. And then we're also going to be working on a, let's see if I can get the slide to advance. We're also going to be working on a small area study um, on the eastern side um, of the Highway 78 corridor. Um, so that's looking, you know, uh, specifically at some of the older commercial and industrial areas along the US 78 Veterans Memorial Corridor, looking at the area along State Route uh, 6, um, kind of the old West Fork um, commercial development that first started coming online around 1975, as I mentioned earlier, um, and then looking at some of those development nodes in that area. And again, this is also critical because this is all surrounded by a lot of uh, 
established, stable, single-family neighborhoods. So we want to make sure that as we plan for future growth and development in these areas, we are primarily being responsive to the needs of the community and the needs of these established neighborhoods. And that's where the voice of the community becomes so important in this process. So to that end, let's see. I want to make sure that everybody knows how they can stay involved in the process. Sorry. So we have a website through the Celebrate Douglas County main website. If you go to the planning and zoning page, um, you can kind of stay informed in everything that we're doing with the comprehensive plan update um, through our website. Um, so you're going to be able to see where there's greater opportunities for your input um, as we're developing these small area studies, the character areas, and the overall comprehensive plan update. Um, we will have a booth at the September Saturdays. That'll be the first big opportunity for public input. Um, so we hope that you'll come out and see us there. Um, we do have a citizen steering committee that's driving this process. Um, so those meetings are open to the public for anyone who may be interested in that. And as always, don't hesitate to just stop by my office if you want to have a conversation or share some, some feedback or learn a little bit more about what's going on. Um, so with that being said, one of the key components that we're going to be looking at as a part of the comprehensive plan update is going to be housing. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to share with you kind of a broad overview of how the comprehensive plan helps us address all of the land use in Douglas County. Um, but, but we are going to make sure that as a part of this plan update that we're taking a really close look at both our single family detached housing stock as well as our various options for multifamily and attached um, housing stock. So I'm going to share a few um, just kind of basic high level characteristics with you this morning about housing. Um, we're going to get a little bit into the data. I'm going to try to not uh, go too heavy into the data as I know that it's early this morning. Um, but we're going to start talking about our rental housing first. Um, because rents have gotten high, I don't think I'm telling anybody something that they don't know at this point. Um, but the median gross rent in Douglas County right now is a little over $1,100. So that's higher than the state average. Um, we know that 67.6% .6 of occupied rental units lease for more than $1,000. Um, so we do know that rents are getting high in Douglas County. Um, and all of this information is from the census. So we've given you um, notations if you'd like to go to to census.gov and look up some of this information on your own. I'm just sharing a little bit of high level information with you today, but this is all public data so you can kind of do a little bit more of a deep dive on your own. We wanted to make sure as we're talking about rental rates, we're also looking at home ownership rates. Those two things go hand in glove. Um, so right now the census is reporting to us that home ownership rates in Douglas County are about 65.5%. Um, and as we look at value for homes, we see that about 40% of home values are above $200,000. Now that may not sound like a lot, um, so I should qualify that by saying that public data is usually fairly conservative, right? The numbers that we see in public housing data tend to lag a little bit behind um, sort of the real value that we see going on on the ground. And I know that we have some other expert panelists here with us today that are gonna give you um, some more information about that. Um, but I did wanna let you know that, that in looking at what's going on in housing in the market today, it is busy. Right? There is a lot going on. So if you look at kind of the publicly available data through census and tax records and things like that, that's where you tend to get a little bit more of a conservative estimate of value. When you go online to some of the big housing data aggregators like Zillow and Redfin and Realtor, that's where you start to see you know, kind of a more up-to-date, real-time reflection of values. And if you pay attention to any of this, you know that housing values have kind of really increased um, over the last 18 to 24 months. Um, and I'll let some of my other panelists speak to where they think the housing market um, is going. But you can see, you know, right now we see our housing value if you're trying to actually buy or sell a house is sitting a little bit more somewhere between 300 to $350,000 is kind of the average value that we're seeing right now in Douglas County. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about household characteristics while we're on this topic. So right now in Douglas County, we have about 54,000 housing units, plus or minus. It depends on what data set you're looking at. But, but generally speaking, it's all very consistent um, in telling us that of that 54,000 housing units, about 82% is gonna be a single family detached house, okay? So that means about 15% are gonna be attached family um, housing. So that's gonna be you know, your apartments, your condominiums, things of that nature. Um, we still have, uh, a thriving um, sector for manufactured homes and manufactured home parks. We don't have a lot of them 
anymore, and a number of them go back, again, to that mid-century, 1960s and 1970s. Um, but they're still going, and as an asset class, they've been very interested to investors. So we've seen a number of investors come in and start to reinvest in our manufactured home parks. To that end, we have about 2,000 uh, manufactured home units in Douglas County right now. All right. So I'm going to share a few maps with you here. I'm going to click through this a little bit quickly here, but I wanted to give you an idea of where development is happening. So this first map that I'm showing you here is kind of the change in total housing units. Now this is census data, so what you're looking at is a picture of 2020. Okay, We know that's a couple years old at this point, but it's the most recently available data that I had. So what you're looking here is the change in total housing units, and you can see these colors all over the place, right? The blues are the smaller numbers, the reds and yellows are the larger numbers. But I share this map with you to kind of underscore this idea that we have people building housing all over Douglas County, right? So, so again, you've, you've heard us say Douglas County is open for business, and I think that this map really kind of underscores that fact. Um, I'm going to click through a few slides that show where we're seeing the most multifamily housing units. So that's three to four units in a building, five to nine units in a building and up. Right, because what you'll see as I click through these slides, um, again, the blue is the smaller number, the reds and yellows are the larger number, is that a lot of these are clustering uh, in, near the, in the city of Douglasville, right? And that's to be expected. That's where you have your infrastructure, that's where you have your higher intensity housing. I should also note that these maps are based using census tracts, so that's why the boundaries are a little awkward. But what we're seeing, right, as I click through these slides, and you can see where the colors pop up, is that that's where we're seeing the most development in the higher intensity um, housing units, right? So now when I get to kind of the overall development in detached housing units, you can see how that flips, right? And so again, the blues are the smaller numbers, the reds and yellows are the larger numbers. And so you can see that we're still on that trend where the predominant demand for housing um, is in the single-family detached housing market. But we are seeing a bit of a change in that, and I will talk about that as we talk about development that is coming up. But I want to talk a minute before we get there about our single-family housing size. So we've been working with our community partners and talking a little bit about the history of building single-family detached housing in Douglas County. Right, and it's evolved over time. So back in the 1970s, the minimum housing square footage was about 1,000 square feet. You know, anywhere between 1,000 to 1,400 square feet, depending on what zoning district you were building in. And you can kind of see as we go through the years, we've pulled our zoning codes, you know, all the way back to 1974, and we've seen an incremental adjustment up to what is today our current minimum square footage for a detached single family house, which is about 1,800 square feet. Now, one of the other things that we've been doing is looking at permit data, right? And so we're wondering, you know, is our requirement for single family housing square footage out of line with other communities? When we've looked at zoning codes from all of our adjacent communities, what we're generally seeing is that we're not the lowest and we're not the highest, right? So we're pretty much kind of there in the middle. And I pulled five years worth of building permit data just to understand what the trend is. So the numbers that I've highlighted there in yellow show you that what we're seeing is this incremental trend in our permit data that shows that the market is sort of driving the increase in, in minimum square footage. Um, so going back to 2018, you know, of the 228 single family residential building permits pulled, 117, excuse me, 177 of those permits were above 1,900 square feet. Right, so just looking at where a number that I would argue people are very intentionally not building right at the minimum, right? They're deciding to build above the minimum. And then you can see how that data tracks per year until we get up to uh, 2021, which is the last full year that I have data available. And in that year, of the 364 single family detached permits available, 332 permits were above 1,900 square feet. So that's 90% of the single family detached building permits that were issued um, are basically above our minimum. So we do see this trend in the market that for single family homes, we're really seeing that demand for bigger homes. Um, now let me talk a little bit about what we were doing to analyze our existing housing stock, right? Because we understand that we have a, a, a good fortune of having strong 
single family uh, neighborhoods. They're very stable. In some instances, the housing stock may be older, but generally speaking, I don't see that in Douglas County. We have a big problem with blight or neglect um, or houses not being taken care of. Um, as we look at our neighborhoods on a subdivision by subdivision basis, you know, and that's one thing that we'll take a close look at as a part of our comprehensive plan update. You know, I feel that our housing stock is generally good. It's generally solid in Douglas County. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a map of what we would call subdivisions, right? So these are developments that have come in as master plan subdivisions in Douglas County. For as much as I've given you a fair amount of data, big picture about the county, what I understand is that people understand how well the county is doing by looking around at what they see going on in their neighborhood, right? So, so how their HOAs are being managed, you know, how their, how their neighborhood is being kept up, how the, how the roads and everything immediately adjacent to their neighborhoods are being kept, kept up. That's valuable. That's important because that's a big part of how, you know, our citizens uh, appreciate the overall uh, value and well-being of their community. And so as one of the things that we're doing as a part of this analysis for the comprehensive plan update is looking at where we have, you know, um, kind of how the existing housing square footage is clustered. So, so this is a map that we've been looking at about where housing clusters that's below 1,800 square feet as opposed to where it clusters that it's above 1,800 square feet. Um, because one of the ways that I think we can preserve affordability in our housing is looking at the tools we have to preserve those smaller existing houses, right, that came in in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s before our housing minimums um, became a little bit larger. And we do see that those tend to spatially cluster, you know, um, when we look at them on a map. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is housing by year built, right? Because generally speaking, we want to make sure that as our older housing stock ages out, that we're bringing a good amount of new housing stock online. Um, and so this is all using tax data. And again, this is all data that we can spatially map to understand, you know, where we have housing of an existing age, where does it cluster, and where do we see the demand for new housing coming online. And then this map is going to look like quite a party um, because I'm just starting to work on this. But this is where we're also starting to analyze um, housing by exterior finish, right? And so we've had some, some questions recently about, you know, are we doing everything that we can to make sure that we're maintaining our existing housing stock, you know, but also looking to be flexible with new materials that are coming online, right? So the first step in understanding that is understanding what's already built in the ground. So again, this is using existing tax data and getting a little bit deeper into the data and understanding, well, how does that cluster? Where are we seeing, you know, these trends in materials that have been built um, over time in the county? So stay tuned for this. Um, but I just share all this information with you as an example of the kind of analysis that we're doing at the county level to make sure that we understand what's going on with our housing on the ground every day. Um, and then I'm going to wrap up here by giving you a little bit of insight um, about our current future development summary. So right now we have 624 new residential lots and 10 projects that are coming out of the ground. Um, so those are basically lots that are approved um, for construction. So builders can come in and build, build, pull building permits on those lots right now. We have about 1,500 new residential units that are under uh, review in 12 new projects. So I would say that these are projects that in the next 18 to 24 months you could see this housing coming out of the ground. They're going through development review. Um, they're getting their final approvals, right? So they're very close to being able to pull building permits. And so I wanted to note that of that total, approximately 50% of those are townhomes or apartments, and the rest are single family detached, right? So you'll recall that a lot of what I've talked to you about historically is kind of that majority that we have of single family detached and how we have significantly fewer attached um, and multifamily housing units in Douglas County. We've recognized that, and so we're really working to kind of correct that imbalance um, in our housing market. Um, and then finally, we have an additional 1,600 units that I would say are in the concept phase. So we anticipate that probably in the next three to five years, you'll see that coming online. Um, so I would say that's kind of a healthy housing pipeline for a county our size. Um, bear in mind that this information is just for unincorporated Douglas County. This doesn't include information on anything for uh, city of Douglasville, city of Austell, or city of Villarica. Um, so this is just new housing that we have coming online in Douglas County. And we do keep an eye on our housing through a couple of different housing studies. So I'll share that information with you just briefly as I wrap up here. 
Um, in 2017, Douglas County completed a housing market study, and that was really where we started to understand that imbalance that we had between single family housing and attached family housing. Um, so again, key findings is that we really had seen the delivery of new housing starting to slow since the 1940s. And that's not unique to Douglas County, right? We're seeing that all over Metro Atlanta um, and, and really beyond Metro area. Um, and so we're seeing um, that really in the next decade, Douglas County needed to look at how they could bring an increased number of um, uh, attached homes, multifamily homes online to help balance out you know, that larger number of single family detached homes. We also need to look at tools and resources to be able to um, start to transition you know, some of the uh, single family detached rental homes back to home ownership so that we can make sure that we're preserving that key tool for affordability, or excuse me, for wealth creation um, for our communities. So um, in addition to that, um, the city of Douglasville in 2021 recently completed a housing study. Um, and, and so they had a lot of findings that echoed what we had seen five years earlier in that county study. Um, but, uh, but again, they kind of added a little bit more detail in terms of the overall cost burden that we're starting to see in some of our housing. Um, they pointed out what I thought was a fairly interesting um, bit of information that not only were our lower income families having a hard time finding housing, um, but also our higher income families were having a hard time finding housing, right? So we seem to be doing okay in that middle income tier um, in Douglas County, but I thought it was interesting that they kind of pointed out that discrepancy there. and then. In terms of a couple of their key recommendations, you know, they just uh, suggested that um, looking at kind of some specific zoning changes, promoting more of a mix of uses, you know, in housing. So, so things like that, that, that we really feel like we could take from the Douglasville housing study and carry out into the county um, as well. So that was all good information. And finally, I'll conclude with saying that we're always keeping an eye on what's going on in housing. And I think this is a good segue to some of our other panelists who are gonna share with you more detailed information um, about what we see in the market right now. Um, but we kind of are getting the feedback that there's some trends coming out of the pandemic, you know, especially with remote working and people having more options, wanting to maybe move out, have something a little bit bigger, you know, but still have access to a center city, um, still have the ability to, to remote work, but have a little bit larger home, but a more affordable home. So we think that that's a trend that will benefit Douglas County going forward. And then we're also starting to see some cooling, you know, of what has been that kind of superheated housing market. Um, so just know that that's something that we may see that will impact us uh, here going forward. Um, and with that, I will conclude with my contact information, remind you to go to our website, learn a little bit more about the comprehensive plan update, um, and please stay involved. Don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any other questions. Um, and that concludes what I have uh, brought with me to share with you this morning, but I look forward to uh, being able to answer any questions or have a discussion with our panelists. So thank you. Thank you, Allison. But stay there. We got, got oh, just one more. I want to bounce something off of you. I appreciate that the context and that information. So you said 85% of our households are single family. Yes, sir. 82%. 82%. And 15% are the others, multifamily, et cetera. Yes, sir. Right. In the 2017 study, what percentage of our homeowners were renters? In the 2017 study? I don't know if I know that off the top of my head. Um, for the 2017 study, I would have to go back and look and see if I put that in our presentation. Um, but uh, we have about 65% of our housing is single family occupied housing. So I would say that, you know, we've heard the number of roughly between 30 and 40% of our household in Douglas County is rental housing. I don't know if that was the number in the 2017 study, but anecdotally, that's the kind of rule of thumb number that I, that I share with folks is that we hear between 30 and 40%. And I see some of our panelists shaking their head like maybe that sounds like it's spot on, so. Yeah, it, it, as a matter of fact, I, I already knew the answer. It is, it's 38%. Yes. So if 40% of our, our, our homeowners are renters, and you've got 15% that are apartments, what does that make that? Almost 50%? Close to it. 50% of Douglas County are renters. Stay with me. And we want to get into it with the other panelists. Like, guys, this is a new reality. It's shifting, right? You know, again, remote. The younger generation is not seeing it like the older generation. It's shifting. So all this data is very important for us to figure out where we're going to go, how do we you know, promote the right thing. 
my experts are going to come and sort of dig a little bit deeper into that, but it's just when it was like, okay, look at the reality now. I get ideological, but look at the numbers don't lie. So anyway, I just want to highlight that. Allison, thank you so much yes, for that. You're going thank to be you. around for the panel. Um, thank you so much, and we're going to keep this moving. Let's give Allison a hand clap, guys, for those. All right. Next up, Ivy. Next, we have Amy, Amy McCoy. Determination is something Amy McCoy brings to all she does, and it is what has enabled her to set records for closing deals, securing creative financing to revitalize neighborhoods, help clients overcome obstacles to achieve their happiness. Over the years, she has done nearly every type of transaction and is confident she can help you get where you want to be. Just recently, Amy has appointed chair of the Federal Financing and Housing Policy Committee for the National Association of Realtors and as the broker of My Hometown Reality Realty Group, which just celebrated nine years here in Douglas County. Amy will continue to support your success as lifelong realtor and advocate. Please welcome Amy McCoy. Why, thank you. So uh, yes, I am Amy McCoy, and as most know me around Douglas County, the Amy McCoy, and now that's a dot com, so check it out. All right. So yes, I am the broker of my hometown realty group, and I have been serving, uh, actually, I, when I got my real estate license, I started in Douglas County. I really wanted to start in a community that I knew nothing about, which forced me to learn everything I could about it. Um, so I've seen the highs, I've seen the lows, I have been right here with you as a resident, but not only as a resident, as a business owner. Um, as Ivy said, I just celebrated my ninth year um, as the owner of my hometown Realty Group, and I selected Lithia Springs because I felt it gave the most homiest hometown feel in being right inside of a community. And a community that then wind up having the um, the uh, opportunity zone brought to it, right? Now, my, my office is literally right across the street from it. Um, however, I looked at that as an opportunity to bring type of investors in to help try to clean up an area that I had felt at one point had been forgotten. Um, and other community stakeholders were feeling the same way. And so one of the beautiful things about Douglas County and our leaders, as well as our city leaders, um, is that they were willing to listen. Um, once we had a change of administration, you saw that they were willing to hear you out and say, hey, I think we can come to a meeting of the minds so that we can bring residents back into home ownership, which is what I really want to talk to you about. As you heard the commissioner say, you know, between renters versus homeowners, home ownership is really the true key for community stakeholdership. Okay, we all want to know where our tax dollars are going and you don't see as much people invested in that per se when you are just in a rental mentality. Now, as an investor myself, I have tenants. As an owner of a property management company, I deal with tenants. So it is truly a life cycle in that you hope that that person that is having to rent will eventually become a homeowner. And just to give you an idea, and I'm sorry I don't have all the pretty slides that my beautiful panelists had, but the average net worth of a renter versus a homeowner is staggering. Okay, how many believe that for the average uh, net worth for a renter is really around $5,000? Can y'all believe that? Yeah, and for an average homeowner, before this skyrocket of, mar of prices, the average net worth of a homeowner was over 200,000. So when we talk about true generational wealth, we're really talking about the way to achieve that, the fastest and most easy, you would think, is gonna be through home ownership, okay? So the importance of home ownership is also how we fund, in America, how we fund our schools is through our tax dollars. So we need that home ownership in order to be able to help cover some of those expenses. And again, that's where you get your accountability on how the performance are because you as an active stakeholder is gonna be there and involved, correct? We can't just show up only when a child is not doing great, right? We wanna know where those dollars are going. Okay, I, I think I'm, see, I'm hearing amens under the head shakes. Okay, all right. <laughs> 
But what I want to do is I want to talk to you about um, a couple of the, the numbers. Okay, Allison did a great job on showing you between the difference of square footage, but what I want to do is I want to take um, you through a quick uh, journey of what we have done on a local level, but also I want you to consider it from a state level, and because, you know, I've been blessed to work on a national level, you have to see how a snowball can come downhill and can go splat, okay? Uh, if anyone had lived in Douglas County through the financial crisis, then you'll understand why it's important to really have true community stakeholdership, just to make sure that our administration understands that they have teamwork happening in our community, okay? Because they can't do it by themselves. They need community stakeholders to be a part of the process, okay? So just as a starter, um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and hit from a national level, and then I'll take you to the local level. Um, and so that way you'll have a, a greater understanding. Um, and I'll even take you through the economic impact necessarily of having home ownership and why it's important to be a part of that. So, sorry, you gotta love all the papers, right? All right. So if we take a, a marketing, a, a housing market snapshot, uh, just in July of 2022, the overall sales volume was over four billion two million two hundred thirty-eight million seven hundred nine thousand two hundred and fifty-four. If that's not a lot, that's a lot. That's a lot of money. That's the type of money that's being moved around in our market now. Okay, that's 9,979 homes sold. Okay, now the difference of that from tw July of 2021, keep this in mind. Okay, that's a one year time difference. We had over 12,564 homes sold. So, what that's telling you is we've seen that decrease in the amount of homes being able to be purchased. Okay, there is that shortage. We had uh, and, and right now there's a current active listings of 20,732. Now, here's another big perspective of that because this time last year, we only had 13,188. So we were dealing with a huge decrease in our inventory. And one is, what is one thing we've learned? It's all about supply and demand. So as we consider the way that we plan for our community, we have to consider where the numbers are at that moment. Pre-pandemic levels are helpful, but we also have to keep in mind that the pandemic, pandemic has changed some things. Just like during the last financial crisis, that changed a lot of things for Douglas County. We went through a lot of redlining issues. Uh, we still have exclusionary zoning um, that should be changed. Uh, but we have leaders now that are willing to listen, but we have to be mindful of what's happening and not just be reactionary in the moment, but planning for proper smart growth, okay? Because that's a 57.2% increase in terms of active inventory. Now, the difference between now and last year was what? Interest rates. I know that's what was going on in your mind, right? That's what was going on in your mind. So those are things we can't control, just like we couldn't control the pandemic. We couldn't control those that weren't able to uh, keep their jobs at the beginning of the pandemic and now have had to pivot. But we hope that there was resources that they were able to take advantage of during that time frame, so that they can make sure that they got their feet back on solid ground so that they could keep their homes and not interfere with that opportunity of net worth. I myself, unfortunately, lost my fiance during the pandemic. But when I did sell my house after four years, it was a nice, pretty chunk of change that allowed me to move it over to buy three more houses, right? So I don't have kids or my legacy in that perspective, but let's just say my godchildren are gonna have some homes to play with once they get older, right? I want that for you. I want you to be able to say, hey, I wanna be a homeowner or not just necessarily a homeowner of one property, but something that I can build my net worth for my children that we can own multiple homes for them to be able to live in. Because having that type of asset 
allows you to be able to pay for college or start your own business. And Douglas County can truly appreciate that, you know, because we obviously want you to have your business here in Douglas County, right? It is a community where your business can thrive. I just got to throw that, you know, chamber feeling out there, okay? <laughs> All right, so just to give you another perspective, here in the current market right now, we have, so where the inventory itself went down to 0.97 months of inventory supply in July of 2021, we now have an increase of 67%, which brought us up to 1.74 months supply. Now I know you're thinking, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it still has a lot to do with it because a healthy market, housing supply market, is gonna be more than three months supply, okay? Because what we're doing right now in this current market, which is why they increased the inflation, the rates, was so that they can slow down the process of, how, of trying to catch up with the inventory. But that necessarily didn't affect the housing market the way people thought it would. It didn't slow down the institutional buyers, the people with cash. All it did was stop owner occupants from having the opportunity to be in a house that was gonna be a lot more affordable. So for me, I have had the pleasure of serving on a lot of uh, committees within the National Association of Realtors. And one that I'm, I'm very proud of that have now been selected as being a chair for the committee uh, is the Federal Finance and Housing Policy Committee. And what this committee oversees is how government finance loans are able to be secured by the borrowers in order for the assets they're trying to achieve, okay? So that's your FHA buyers and your VA buyers, your USDA buyers, okay? What that means is, as an example, in 2019 when I first served on this committee, at that time, VA borrowers weren't really able to achieve a loan higher than $475,000. Now, you could have found a home during that time frame here in Atlanta. However, if you were in California, that's a really tough feat, right? I lived in a community where a teardown was 500,000. So here you done served your time for the country and you were being promised of home ownership when you returned and then you don't even qualify for anything in your community. And so we needed to change that. So we did. So anything that you have to go from a policy standpoint, unfortunately has to go through Congress. So uh, say a little prayer for me in the next coming years, okay? <laughs> but I say that also is because one of the biggest things that just accomplished for veterans that happened this past December, that again, we had worked on in 2019, was now veterans are able to buy more than one home under that a same eligibility certificate. So now you can build your net worth as a service provider, whether you're an active military or as a veteran. I'm back and forth to DC a lot just to make sure that I'm advocating. And I'm not a, I'm not a veteran myself. However, I have a lot of veterans in my household, okay? So it is important that they're able to grow their assets for their children to be able to have as they grow older. But not only that, for FHA borrowers, we were able to expand access through condominiums. I look at it as this. Not everybody's meant to be a single family resident homeowner. Okay, let's, let's hit reality. I'm 41, <clears throat> but I hate cutting grass, okay? I really hate cutting grass. I've got the most beautiful garden because my tenant comes and cuts my, my roses and everything, and I love her for it. Thank you, Dee Dee. But the reality is, and you see it, you might drive in your neighborhood and that person hates cutting their grass. Their grass is knee high and keeping up with a lot of mosquitoes. Or you see that tarp has been on their roof for more than a year because they don't have the funds in order to replace the roof. Or that you have the windows up all the time because they haven't been able to replace their AC unit. And that's because they're in maybe a 3,000 square foot house. It was their first house or they had a plumbing issue. And now they don't have the means or financial capability in order to do those repairs. So that property falls in disrepair, right? And if they most likely didn't have the money to repair their own asset, most likely they're deficient in their HOAs. It's just a thought. 
So if we had more accessibility to condominiums, right? So that way it's a smaller footprint. They don't have to cut grass, okay? Their utilities are more reduced. Their, uh, you know, and it's a little different than when you would have an apartment community. Can we agree to that? If you've ever lived in a condominium, you probably agree that everyone has a different form of respect when it's an ownership standpoint than when it's a rental standpoint. So I would like for us to consider that. I've had the luxury of being able to grow up in other countries. Aside, even though I'm a, a Georgia peach, okay, and I claim Atlanta, however, I've also had the luxury of growing up in other countries. And so I'm a big proponent to being able to have multifamily, okay, because I believe in more green space and preserving our green space. And that way you're leaving a lot more room for more innovative opportunities to come into a community like potentially way down the road, light rail. We want communities of walkability. We want communities that speak to someone of the millennial time, you know, age bracket, but even for our seniors. A lot of them don't want to be able to have to get in a car to drive way downtown or even have to wait for somebody to pick them up. I'm a walker. When I go to other cities, I love being able to explore the streets, go into different businesses, or go right into my house or my place of residence at that moment, because most likely it's a hotel. But having that walkability allows for you an opportunity to have more community relationship, being able to speak to your neighbors. I live in the beautiful community of the tributary. Woo, woo, for all my folks on virtual world. You know, that's one of the beautiful things about that community is we have a lot of front porch conversations. And I would love to see Douglas County on the rest, you know, with that in mind, okay? Also with bike trails. So, you know, our housing prices can lend towards that because it's a different mentality. Those are people that are wanting to be invested with their community. Now, I'm not saying that all tenants are not worthy, not saying that at all, okay? Because there are some that are just not ready to ever become homeowners or perfectly not ready to commit to that type of investment. I strongly urge that you become, change that mindset. But it's really important in how we look at how homes are sold today. So to give you another dive into, in July of 2021, there was 239 homes that were sold, okay? The average list price at that time was only 291,000, and the average sold price in July of 2021 was 295,000. Now let's fast forward. We sold 167 homes in July of 2022, but the average list price uh, that sold in July of 2020, uh, 2022 was 343,000. That was the list price, I'm sorry. And then the sold price was 345,000. So that was in line with Allison had just put up that Zillow and Redfin and everything was on. But here's the kicker. Because the, act, the current active list price this month, okay, we have 393 properties on the market. The average active list price is now 419,000. And we have 269 of them that are under contract with the active contract price at 409,000. So you see how much of a drastic increase that was in just one year. And then you see how much of a change that was in one month. So how convenient that Zillow was able to give you some perspective. But here's another perspective I want you to keep in mind of. Because as involved as I am in housing, and this is all that I do, 18 years in, when I see institutional buyers, and it's not just them, because institutional buyers are more considered the larger firms. I had an opportunity to grow in my portfolio, okay? So this is not just all the large companies, a lot of smaller companies, but the difference of the smaller companies and larger companies is there's a way of more diversification and where they decide to select at. Where we've been able to see a study came from Georgia Tech 
um, in June, and I've sent it to county commissioners, several county leaders, that more than 48% of the sales that happened in Atlanta all went to institutional buyers. Now, when you look at the lack of inventory and where we're having to chase You've probably seen it in your social media timeline. I've had properties, my listings would have 30 to 40 offers presented on them. And it's like, how do you cipher through that? Well, for me, I educated my seller, okay? Not, a lot of people are in this industry because they thought they were gonna get rich quick. Let me burst that bubble now. In real estate, it is not a get rich quick scheme, okay? Not selling at least, <laughs> but the reality is we actually have a pulse on what's happening. And if we're conscious, we're able to help influence the way so that it does not see the same effects that we saw during the financial crisis. So for me, I'm very active and proactive in making sure that I'm talking to my community leaders to give them a heads up, hey, this is what I'm seeing in the market swing, you know? When we talk about the type of buyers that are in the market now, you're finding that, yes, the millennial and zennial, okay, there's a lot of these names, right? <laughs> but they're actively in the market looking to purchase. Now, it's different when you used to see that, on average, homes used to change over every three to five years. Well, now 16% of Douglas County has lived in their house between five and nine years. So we see that not everybody's quick to jump. Now, why could that be? Probably they have PTSD from the financial crisis. I know I do, I don't know about y'all, but I do. And then especially if you've gone through COVID, you see that more people want multi-generational housing. So not necessarily do we have to build the largest square footage to cram everybody under one roof, because as much as I love my mom and my brother and my sister and I wanna have this amazing compound for everybody to live in, I recognize I can't live with all of them, okay? But if we had a different way of thinking, like triplexes or quads, that allows us to consider density housing on a smaller footprint that still frees up a lot of green space. And it allows you to have that multi-generational housing where you're not necessarily under the same roof. Mom may not want to spend time with their teenage daughter, I mean not teenage daughter, but you know, just graduated from high school daughter or son or have to return back home and nobody wants all that, right? But we might wanna come home for mama's cooking, okay? So there's a lot of opportunities that we can think in that space and that is backed by government finance loans like FHA and VA. And that's, that could be a million dollar property where now you are yielding to the tax digest that we're trying to achieve. So kind of consider that. If we're only thinking of single family residents, then we're not giving ourselves a lot of innovative opportunities to look at different type of quality housing. So with that, I will close with just giving you an idea of the economic impact because the real estate industry accounted for $127.9 billion and that's 18.7% of the gross state product in 2021. That's a huge number. So when we went through that financial recession last time because of our housing market crashing, you could see how much of an impact that, that became. And I will tell you, we need to make sure that we're thinking ahead of it when, this, you know, when we start to see the foreclosures pick back up. Um, with that, I will end, and I am so appreciative, and I hope you will give me a call, Amy McCoy, with my hometown Realty Group. Thank you. Thank you, Amy, all right. Don't go anywhere, I've got, all right, so to your point, um, I moved out here in 1990. 71,000 people lived here. 2000 census, 98, 2010, 124, right now 146. So the population has doubled since I've been here. And what, I, what, I've, what I've noticed being here all this time and watching it evolve to what it's become, um, there's one thing, and I know our, our other panelists are going to come speak to it when we go through those crises, right? It, it, it happens. Um, but it's a function of wages. It, you know, again, think about Maslow's arc your needs, food and shelter, fundamental. It's not about a dream. It's like, I just want to function. I want to protect my household. I want to come and go. 
And so to my citizens, I bring this up because my son came to me last week, the oldest, 25 years old, said, I'm moving out mom's house. Well, it's about time. And he said, but I don't want a home. Different generation. Now, being the banker that I am, and I can sit there and explain to him the benefits of it, he's like, no, I don't, I don't need all that. Now, me being blind, I don't need a house, but it's okay. I mean, what, I mean forget cutting grass, I ain't cutting none either. Don't feel bad, Amy. <laughs> but, but I'm saying that there's different, we talked about character areas, um, about our land. District 4 is different than District 2. Each one of us are very different. We have our own characters. There's no one way to think about anything. It, it becomes, you, you got to settle in. Yes, we got, I mean, I'd love to have some condos out here. That's what I'd love to be. We don't have that product type out here. You, you know, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. But I encourage all of you who are listening to this um, online and in person is that, you know, Amy brought some good points is that, yes, it does drive our, prop our property taxes, drive our school system. It contributes. Absolutely. But if you see the tide shifting and that the citizens are pretty much that younger generation says, they're not going to do it that way. What do you do? And so you've got to come up with creative ideas and creative financing ways and clear of money. Everybody just got barely got $61,000, the average medium income in, in Douglas County. And so, yeah, they just look for their first, first home, if they can get one. What if they never realize it? What if my choice is just to have look like the battery and have live, work, and play? How do, how do we now anticipate that? And that's what Allison, this, this future land study, all this is going to help us determine how are we going to shape this? How are we going to shape the policy? How are we going to shape the code um, that will enable our, a, a better tomorrow? But uh, my question to you is that what do you see? You see a shift in, in, in values of the younger generation? So, I, you know, and that's a very good question. There is a shift. There is a shift because we have more than 3 million millennials that make over $100,000 a year. So that's not to say that there, we have to consider, well, there's a two-part. We have to still consider affordability, okay? But we don't need the larger footprint. Okay, we really don't. What we're looking for is the amenities of storage, of still, hey, we, we want to have that flex, like, I'm vegan, so I don't need this state-of-the-art kitchen. However, I just want to look like I know what I'm doing when it comes to Christmas time. So, you know, you have to just look at the way of catering to that mindset. People don't need, um, when you look at, we're not having a lot of children in this time day you know um, so we may not need that four or five bedroom however you might find that one and two bedroom homes if you're going to do single family residence still sell just as fast as the four and five bedroom we have the shortage because right now you're finding people like myself as a single person we're taking these three and four bedroom houses and so that doesn't allow accessibility for those that are at families to be able to take those in, that inventory that may be more affordable for them. So you have to really look at holistically everything of what type of housing supply is there as to what is coming into the county already and what you're truly planning for. Because if you don't have kids, five bedrooms may not, and I, you know, don't wanna speak for everybody out there in the world, but five bedrooms may not be conducive to what we may need. And so it's more about that walkability, it's more about that restaurant eating or social opportunities outside of the house. When you've got too much of a house, you just find a whole bunch of catch-all rooms and uh, yeah, <laughs> next thing you know, you look like a hoarder. So that's what we don't want. But I do believe that we have, as long as we're properly preparing, we're going to be able to attract the young professionals that are coming into this market that are business owners or heads of large organizations that have decided to choose Douglas County as a place to run their business. We just need to be able to start developing that type of inventory that caters to them. I sell all around the state and have a big influence even internationally. And so if I can watch $82.6 billion sent to Dubai, and a lot of them are young professionals, I think that's money that we should be keeping here in the United States, personally. And I think we have an opportunity for that here in Douglas County. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Thank My you very pleasure. much. Yes, thank you so much. Guys, one more time. Get a hand clap. <laughs> All right. Next speaker, we won't keep, we got a speaker or a break? Where were we at, Ivy? We have next speaker. Break. Next speaker. Okay.
Our next speaker is Greg Wallace, Executive Director, Director of Home Builders Association. Greg has knowledge on what is going on currently in the entire Douglas County as it relates to home building. Please welcome Greg Wallace. Welcome, Greg. Thank you, I got one right here. Is this on? Yes. I'm the executive officer of the West Side Home Builders Association, which is actually a five county association. Um, we cover Douglas, Carroll, Harrelson, Paulding, and Polk counties. And so my view is, is a, a bigger, broader view than, than just Douglas County, although I live in Douglas County and have for, gosh, 20, over 25 years. So I'm very familiar with the Douglas County market. My background, just very quickly, I'm an attorney by education, but I've been in the real estate industry um, since a year after law school, uh, from a broker to a developer to a builder back to basically a developer. Um, here in Douglas County, some of you are familiar with Holly Springs, uh, the three subdivisions within the community of Holly Springs, that was my development. And then I've been in South Fulton and other areas, Savannah, Florida, et cetera, as far as development. Uh, so I've got a pretty broad background in uh, the real estate industry. So basically what I wanted to do today was just simply give you some, some quick information uh, relative to uh, the marketplace. And especially what's going on with new homes. Um, relative to the marketplace in general, and I'm still, I'm talking about not just our five counties, but really the entire South. What has occurred is there's been an enormous influx and it continues from the West Coast, the East Coast, and the upper Midwest. Uh, for example, um, Seattle, Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco, and, and San Diego. Enormous movement out of California for a variety of reasons into, some of it is, is close, uh, states close to, such as Arizona, but an awful lot of it is coming to the south. Um, the same in, just as an example, there have been 84 companies in a six month period of time that have left California, 84 major corporations that have left California and moving Again, moving east, a lot of it in the south. They're bringing enormous numbers of residents with them, the people who uh, are executives, et cetera, who work for those companies. Uh, you see, that's just 84 companies in a six month period, not counting small businesses, just major corporations. So what we're seeing is an enormous influx from the west coast, we're seeing there were three and a half million people who left New York City from, from the first of 2020 until now. Three and a half million have left New York City, moving a lot of them south. If you look at uh, Florida, for example, and I'm very familiar with that marketplace, I've developed down there, and uh, you'll see where prices have actually doubled uh, since around 2000, well, about three years ago. Prices have basically doubled in a lot of areas of Florida simply because there's an enormous influx of people into Florida with money in their pockets. Why? They're selling houses for twice oftentimes, and let's, let's bring it down to a local level. They're oftentimes selling uh, a house in, let's say, Connecticut or New York, the area, that general vicinity, or on the West Coast, uh, they're selling a house for twice what they can pay here. So they're coming in with money in their pocket, and that's why our, the realtor mentioned to you that there are so many people bidding on houses. There's an enormous influx of people into the South. The biggest influx has been in Texas, Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina, and Florida. And it'll continue for quite some time. Uh, why so much? It's a combination of taxes, it's a combination of regulation in these other areas of the country, and it's crime. Uh, those are the factors. So the bottom line is what we're looking at is a continuing tremendous influx of home buyers. Now that makes competition for our local buyers oftentimes difficult because people are coming in and um, as was previously mentioned, uh, bidding up houses. A house goes on the market for 
$250,000. Somebody comes in and offers two fifty-five. dollars Somebody else will offer two sixty, dollars and on up. And the bottom line is that these people have, again, they have the money in their pockets. So that is just with regard to the influx of buyers. Now, everybody wants to know from the home builder vantage point, why are prices so high? Well, since the first of 2020, um, material prices have gone up 35% for a new home. Everything from lumber all the way down to carpet on the floor. All the prices across the board, basically 35% higher. Why? Um, lots of reasons. One is when the pandemic hit, a lot of the manufacturers went from three shifts a day because the demand was there to one shift. Why? There was just simply the pandemic. And uh, people, they had to get, they had to lay off a lot of people in order to deal with the pandemic. And then they still today have not gotten fully back to three. They're trying to get back to three shifts, but they haven't. That drove prices up. Um, the, the, the supply chain issues, we have, you've seen reports of millions across the entire uh, country of ships sitting offshore, literally two million ships at one point were sitting offshore that couldn't get into port. Now we're talking about the entire East Coast, the entire West Coast, and across the Gulf Coast. Couldn't get into port. There weren't enough uh, workers in the ports to unload them. So then we end up with supply chain issues. When you end up with supply chain issues, prices go up. Why? Lots of reasons, but getting that price goes up relative to getting the materials to the port. And then from the port, you know what's happened with gasoline and diesel. Well, all that diesel has been has doubled since two th the first of 2020. That goes into the price of the materials and on and on and on. There have been, it's not that builders are out there gouging and making more profit. They're making the same amount of profit, but the material cost, the supply chain issues, when you've got a supply chain problem and you can't get, let's say a garage door, it's six months on back order. Well, guess what? That house is sitting for six months. The builder can't complete it and he can't sell it, and therefore he's paying interest on that loan on that house that he can't sell. He's ready to close it. He's got a buyer, he's got a contract, can't close it. So the pri even the, the builders reached a point where they simply said to their realtors, oftentimes, don't sell, don't do any pre-sales. I can't handle any pre-sales because I can't judge what my price is gonna have to be at the, at the time I can actually complete construction because the supply chain issues were so severe. Just lost my glasses. So the bottom line is there are a whole lot of factors uh, involved. Then you throw in interest rates. We've seen a doubling of interest rates. Why? Inflation. What is the real inflation number? Right now they're telling you it's 9.1%. It's Don't believe it. It's not 9.1%. If you go back and you use the same data or the, or the same calculations that were done in the 80s and 90s, that 9.1% would be 18.5%. The real number for materials that we all care about, when you go to the grocery store, the gas pump, et cetera, is about 17% increase in inflation in this country uh, in the last two years. It's a lot of factors involved. But the truth is, we're, all of that applies also to all those materials going into those houses and the, the inflation is extremely high. Interest rates have doubled. So many factors are involved. So the good thing for the housing industry is that we still have this enormous influx. We also have a lot of people who have moved out of Atlanta to what's called the exurbs, which is us. Douglas, Carroll, Harrelson, Paulding, Polk. Um, the suburbs would be more Vinings, Marietta, um, Smyrna, et cetera. So when they come out, or Austell, all those are, are the suburbs. You get out here, you're in the exurbs. A lot of people are moving out of Atlanta to the exurbs. Why? They want more room. Uh, they can work from home, and therefore they need a home office, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so the bottom line is the housing industry is extremely healthy from the vantage point of, or the perspective of, we have um, lots and lots and lots of buyers, but at the same time, that means prices have gone up. Is there a ceiling? Not really, but, and will we, will we see some relief in the near term? Yes. Um, by the first of next year, we're gonna begin to see prices coming down. Why? Some tariffs are being eliminated on softwood coming out of uh, Canada. 
and I can go down a long list, which you don't really care about. But the point is, prices will begin to modify. They'll be, instead of continually going up, they'll begin to, to come back down. But the, but the demand's still going to be there, so that people who are looking to buy a new home, oftentimes are going to have a lot of competition for that home, at least for the next year or two. Um, the financial impact, well, first of all, I mean, one other point. There's a misconception about smaller homes. A lot of people think of smaller homes and they think more of, as previously mentioned, rental homes. Um, a smaller home doesn't mean a, a lower quality home. We need smaller homes in our marketplace and we need regulations that allow for smaller homes. But along with that, it's about the architecture of those smaller homes. You, you can find a beautiful home in this area for anywhere from 12 to 1400 square feet. Beautiful single family homes, gorgeous architecture. The other factor is maintaining those homes as was previously mentioned also, which means that you need a strong homeowners association that will keep up with and require maintenance not only of those yards, but not having, um, forcing people to actually use their garages rather than use it as a storage area. And therefore the, the uh, automobiles are not sitting outside. We've all seen that. Uh, the bottom line is a strong homeowners association is a very important element uh, associated with any community of any size homes, but in the smaller homes specifically. But we need homes for those who can't afford a 3,000 square foot home, but would like to be in single family home ownership. Uh, a lot of people are there, they can't afford the big one and there's not anything available to them in the smaller ones, but it's all about quality, uh, our architecture and quality. So keep in mind that just because it's a smaller home does not mean that it's a uh, lesser quality home. Uh, fi financial impact real quick, just a quick overview of what it means in the housing market relative to new homes. And this comes from the National Association of Home Builders down to the Home Builders Association of Georgia and then to me at the local level. Uh, studies have been done that, that specifically can tell us exactly what occurs with regard to new homes and the economic impact not only for um, individuals, but in this case, relative to our tax base, how it impacts our, um, our local governments, how it impacts income for our residents, and how many jobs are created. So for example, there in the state of Georgia where there were 50, a little over 53,000 new homes built last year. That's just new homes, not counting all the, the, the resales. So of those, you know, in a one year period, what that translates into is $30,400,000 in income to residents. It relates to 419, basically, and that's, that's a little low, it's closer to 500 jobs that are constantly created in the marketplace. And then 6.1 million in taxes that are paid off from those new homes in, this, in that one year to our local governments, which allow our local governments to provide all of our services. So it's, the new home market is immensely important relative to our economy, especially in the five counties that I'm talking about. Because in our five counties, we're not an industrial base. We're, we don't have a huge industrial base out here. Um, you see enormous uh, development going on down 92 uh, where Amazon in South Fulton is putting in a gigantic project. We know we, we brought Google in, but we don't have industry. So a big important component of providing our um, governments with the tax dollars they need to provide the services is new homes and providing the jobs and providing the income in our communities. New homes are immensely important to all of our communities. We saw what happened in the crash when it was shut down completely and therefore there were no new jobs. In fact, people were desperate for jobs. The income levels dropped, the taxes dropped, et cetera. So our, the industry of home building is immensely important to our five counties. Um, the, I think I touched on, I'm just seeing if there's anything else I wanted to cover real quickly. I know you've got time issues. Um, the one other thing that you're probably asking about is interest rates. 
Um, right now, interest rates, we're not going to see a break in interest rates in the time in the near future. We're looking at another Fed increase of probably 0.75, which is going to run them up a little bit higher. But the one thing that we need to remember, when we think of a 5.5 to a 6% interest rate, we're basically saying to ourselves, well, gosh, that's awful compared to 2.68% that we were looking at a year ago or a year and a half ago. Yeah, but we also go back a little bit further, and there was times when 55 to 6% was a great number, um, at least a great interest rate. So you have to sort of look at it um, through a, a multicolored lens. It's not as good as it was, but it's not as bad as it has been. And the bottom line is it's, not going, it's still going to go up a little bit more. So a lot of people are out there saying, I want to get a house now before it goes up any higher. And that's, again, an increase in demand for, for new housing and for existing housing. So the bottom line is we have an extremely healthy market, whether it's existing homes or new homes. Um, and that, that market is going to continue to stay healthy. The one other thing that we need to make sure that we do, we have some officers sitting back there, the Douglas County Sheriff's Department. One of the things that the people are, the reasons they're coming to the South is because of less crime. Uh, if you go and look at the violent crime rates on the West Coast and the big cities across through the Midwest, the Chicago's, Detroit's, et cetera, all the way to the East Coast, New York, Philadelphia, Washington, the crime rates have gone through the roof. Down here, no. And as long as we maintain a very strong police force in, in let's take Douglas County, in Douglasville and at the Sheriff's Department of Douglas County, it's immensely important that we fund our Sheriff's Department and our police departments. Um, I saw a almost amusing ad the other day for, from the, the mayor of Miami, um, an Hispanic gentleman who was saying to those outside the state of, of Florida, come on down. We not only have lower regulation and lower taxes on the corporations down here, but we're increasing the amount of money that we're spending on our police force uh, to make sure that you're safe down here. So the bottom line is we have to make certain that crime is, is held in check. Uh, we know there's, it's out there, but the, but the bottom line is keeping a strong Douglasville police force, keeping a strong um, Douglas County Sheriff's Department is immensely important to every aspect of the real estate industry. And that, that's, I'm going to close it there. I know you've got time constraints, and I don't want to bore everybody. So, um, you know, the bottom line is um, we have a strong industry, and it's going to, going to continue to be so. That it? Very good. Let's give him a hand clap, guys. Come on. No, stay there. Now, now, no, that wasn't boring. That, that was actually pretty good, if you're paying attention. All right, so, so not only do we have people here who are competing for the houses, homes, you got people who are moving in. All right, good, good point of view. Right. They're coming in here with cash. They're competing. Right? And, and so you got different cultures, different ideology showing up here. Right? So as you know, infrastructure begets economic development. Economic development what begets housing. Right? So it, it's, a, it's a pecking order. And of course, and, uh, public safety is there to protect all of that, right? So there, there is a foundation to all this as you progress through this. So I guess my question to you, as you say, you're the western side, so the five counties to, to, the, to the west. Um, how are our builders here in Douglas County? How are our local builders? Here? And by the way, we did have Leslie Chu, which is one of the preeminent builders. He got a little, um, couldn't, couldn't be here this morning and stuff, so I appreciate you being here. But talk to us about the local builders, because, I mean, that's always important as well. Can we find good builders and stuff? Can we find somebody who's going to do this? Explain what LEEDS is, the difference between quality of home versus less quality, because you, you said it, but you didn't say it. Well, the, uh, the bottom line is, and I don't think you can really, I think everybody can hear me. The bottom line is that the home builders that are part of our organization, Westside Home Builders Association, are very strong home builders with an enormous amount of experience. They've been at it a very long time. And the bottom line, they're very high quality builders. So I can, Leslie Chu could speak to this if he had been able to be here today, but, he, but he's ill. And he called me at the last minute to come in and, and help him 
uh, help him out. But the, we have terrific home builders. The problem, let's put that in quotation marks because it's not something that I can do or any, anybody can do anything about is we have a lot of influx of building companies that are national companies. We all know who they are. They're huge builders, immense builders in, in some cases. And when they come in and build homes, they cut a lot of corners, okay? Um, and, not, and not that they don't build a good house, it's just that an individual home builder is oftentimes because he's on his site every day, he's checking on exactly what his subs are doing, he's checking on his supply chain and when he can get materials on site, and then he's making sure that those materials are applied properly, et cetera, et cetera. So most individual home builders who are building a relatively small number of homes are very, very strong builders, and they're building extremely high quality. Um, I also do what's called DET testing for all our builders. Duct and envelope testing is what that is, is required by the federal government. And I have to go in and check out the duct work in the house, and then we do a, what's called a blower door test to find out whether or not the property, the, the new home is properly sealed, and therefore it's, it's an environment, it's an energy saving component of what the federal government requires. Our home builders, that are, all of our home builders, always pass the tests because they build a good, solid, strong structure. And I'm not saying that a national builder doesn't. I'm saying that a, a local builder in Douglas County, Paulding County, Carroll, Harrelson, Polk, those guys are on their sites every, virtually every single day, making sure that this is done properly and that's done properly because they know it's going to catch up with them if they don't. Whether it's from the buyer, the realtor, or from me coming in and doing a test, whatever it may be, it'll catch up with them if they, if they don't do quality construction. So the bottom line is if you're dealing with a local builder, generally speaking, you're going to be dealing with someone who's building high quality. Does that answer your Yes, it does. And I appreciate that. I mean, again, we're just trying to bring context. And just one more point for you, because I keep hearing this thing about the Great Recession versus the pandemic. Right? So the Great Recession was one in which the banks got bailed out. Nothing for the little guy. The foreclosure, you had all that supply, you guys are on, what you're now talking about is the financing part. You had all those interest only negative AM loans. Now, we learned a lot with that. It's about financing, we're gonna get into that in a minute, like okay, y'all, pretty much, pretty much, you got set up. You gave Ferraris to the average citizen from a financing perspective when the balloons came due, bang. Let's, let's make sure we tell the truth about what that was about. Here we are, Congress is smart now. Like, okay, we got to give something to the little guys as well. That's what kept us afloat. Get the labor market. I haven't heard anything about the labor market as well. People got jobs, great attrition, so they're, they're shifting. But I'm, I'm back to the developer. I mean, you guys are important. Builders, developers, and I'm using interchangeably. When you build these communities, we talk about, you know, what about warranties, um, retention ponds, some things I hear homeowners talk about, the builders, it's sort of like, you do, the, you, do the, you do the community and you're gone. You're out the back door. You made your cheese, you're out. I talked to Mr. Kitchens recently, who's you know master developer for um, the studio you're talking about, as well as um, he's the president of uh, the State um, Builders Association. And he says, you know, again, there may be some rogue um, builders out there. He, he, he acknowledged it which I, I respect him for that. Like, don't, don't tell me that it doesn't happen. Don't tell me that developers don't come into communities and don't do a good job. And it was just when you talked about how do we, how do we enforce that? How, I mean, what are you guys doing at the West Georgia um, board, um, board of Builder Board? What are y'all doing to maintain that standard that my citizens, when they enter into those covenants that, that have to go through our, uh, UD, that have to comply with our UDC and our planning and zoning? How, how do, because I'm listening. That y'all for that, but I'm listening to like now. How y'all putting this together now? Well, uh, go ahead. To, there's a lot of echo in here, so I couldn't hear exactly everything that you were saying. But uh, the bottom line is, with regard to warranties, every every new home, uh, virtually every builder that I know, every builder that I know of, is going to provide at least a one-year warranty. Plenty enough time for every homeowner to, if there's a callback, if there's a problem, something doesn't work, something does, uh, there's an issue with a a wall, et cetera, et cetera then there's a one-year warranty for that builder to come back and take care of the issue. Um, labor market. Labor market is a huge problem. Um, basically getting people to come back in and go back to work 
within our lab labor market, but also we have a real problem with, and, and this is something that needs to be emphasized in our school systems, and, it, and it's not right now. Um, there are tremendous opportunities for young people in the labor market of new homes uh, in this five, in our five counties and everywhere. Tremendous opportunities. And I'm talking about, like I said, my background is I was originally educated as an attorney. There are plumbers and electricians who are making more money by far than, attorney, than attorneys and sometimes doctors, etc. And especially those who are going to college, for example, and getting a degree, but that degree is not allowing them to find a decent job. You know, my one of my, um, I call them my children, they're actually nieces and nephews, but an English degree did not provide much of an opportunity to, provide, to obtain a good job. So the bottom line is we need more and more in the trades, what we call the trades. And that can be in everything from uh, foundation work to uh, framing to roofing to electricians to plumbers, et cetera. Uh, we need more of that type of um, opportunity made available within our school systems uh, to help people under, young men, young women, because to nowadays, women absolutely as much as men uh, can go into the trades and uh, make an excellent income in the construction industry. Uh, and we need them desperately. We have a serious problem finding quality uh, individual, and I'm talking about quality subcontractors. Uh, that's why our builders have to be on site every day oftentimes to make sure that quality is there. And, uh, but, but finding good people is extremely difficult. So we really need that help in our industry with regard to our school systems. Was there anything else? No, that, that was it. I mean, I appreciate it. I mean, you, I mean, again, very poignant. I mean, I won't get into immigration. You know, what, what don't, don't, the, the, the homes. Yeah, the there, so. yeah, yeah. So but, but, you know, again, as a labor supply. Because this generation has a different mindset. I'm not, I don't want to do that. And I'm listening to you talk about school system, like, mm-hmm. But I'm looking at my sons. So I'm going to give you perspective about my children. Like, no, they, it's white collar. It's internet. It's, it's, it's different, unlike where I came along, I had no problem with mowing lawns and throwing papers and stuff. So it's shifted. So the question is, do you, we all got to evolve. If I've got to evolve my eyes, the industry has to evolve. And you've got to evolve. I'm like, OK, y'all going to miss that. That labor ain't gonna come back like you think. And you're trying to you're trying to sell students, and it's, you're right, plenty. But your demand is too greater than the supply of students coming through. So it's that disparity, that gap. And I I look forward to solving it. We got policy people in there, and I'm sure y'all guys will work it out. But I just wanted to highlight those things. This is what this forum is about. Get down to the main issues. Let's really talk about it, not just talking heads, but like no, let's talk about this. But I appreciate it, Greg, for you being here, and thank Leslie. I hope he gets well and stuff. Thank you again, guys. Let's give him a hand clap. We got one more speaker before the break. Ivy bringing our last one. Next, we have Mike Stevens. Mike is a veteran banker of 30 plus years in the state of Georgia. Originally from Gainesville, Georgia, and a graduate of the University of Georgia, Mike started his career in banking in Gainesville in 1991 with the former National Bank Corps, now Regions Bank. He came to Douglasville with Regions in 1997 and moved to the community in 2000. He helped found the North Metro Bank in 2007, where in Douglasville, here in Douglasville, and now serves as a senior vice president of commercial banking for Service Bank, Service First Bank. Excuse me. He's proudly served on the boards of the United Way of Douglas County, the Boys and Girls Club of Metro, Metro Atlanta, Douglasville Club, Leadership Douglas, and the Douglas Chamber of Commerce, and is now the board of is now the board chair of the Douglas County Economic Development Authority. Please welcome Mike Stevens. Thank you. All right, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad to be here with you. I thank Commissioner Robinson for his invitation and Ivy on getting me here on time and knowing what I'm supposed to do. So I appreciate that very much. Um, I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to talk on, and some of the things I brought to talk about have been covered. So I'm going to offer a few insights that I have. Um, my world is the commercial lending world, so I don't do the residential piece of it. I work with when they seek to build houses. I work with other types of commercial loans as well, but I do work with a good many builders in the metro Atlanta area. Um, I'll speak on quickly as 
as the board chair for the Douglas County Development Authority, our goal and our ambition is to bring community uh, 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 companies to our community that bring w good paying jobs. One of the things we focus on is what's the average wage per hour? What's the average salary per employee when these companies come to our community? We track that. We ask them to, to provide that data so we know that we're bringing the best quality jobs that we'll, we can have to our community. Um, I've been here since uh, 97, living here since 2000. We used to hear no more warehouse jobs. And now it's like, okay, now we've got a, a, a great supply of data center jobs. We're, our community is changing a great deal. It's, it's complexion as far as the employment base. And our goal as the development authority is to keep track of that and to keep moving us forward so that we have the best paying jobs possible. That, that moves our housing stock forward too. Those people that come here want different housing. Um, one of the things that I'll start with is the ARC, the Atlanta Regional Commission, predicts our population will reach 192,000 by the year 2050. And that would mean we have a 46,000 person increase in our community. That is 1,484 new residents per year. So that's going to keep my friend Chandran, Greg, myself, Allison, and Amy very busy working toward quality housing and managing those houses and working with those builders to get housing and working with zoning to be sure that we do the proper things for our community. So I think it's a very exciting time to be in our business. Um, we all have a lot of expertise and, and it's an exciting time to be here with you. Uh, I'm gonna give you some just anecdotal information I have <clears throat> being in the uh, commercial finance in industry that I see as trends happening. A lot of our builders are looking toward multifamily housing. Now, in the exurbs here and from here west, single family is probably more prevalent, but if you look at going anywhere from here toward Atlanta, uh, and I've had the good fortune of making loans on housing as far as Dawsonville, Georgia, um, South Carolina, and as far west as we go toward Alabama. So we see a lot of the builders, especially the regional and, and, and national builders, looking at multifamily as their trend. And people say, why is that? A lot of things we see is just the cost of land has increased dramatically. So when you used to be able to buy a lot and develop it for maybe 20 to 30,000, that cost per lot now is more like 40 to 50,000 as developed. And that's your, your site clearing, your infrastructure, your, your, your sewer, your water, uh, anything like that. So we see builders say it's more economically feasible for me to build multifamily versus single family in certain markets. Uh, not always the case, but it is a trend we see. A lot of what we've seen recently, and recently is probably since the pandemic, is the build for rent market. We've seen a lot of developers come along who have money coming out of hedge funds, out of, out of much larger cities, that say we see a value in building a whole community for rent. And there are pros and cons to that. People have different opinions about that. But I've looked at deals where we put 150 townhomes in Paulding County. And you would not think Paulding County would have a strong rental market, but those things rented quickly and they rented for market rate. So they were probably $1,400 uh, dollars per month up. So you see those trends and people say, well, why are, they, why are you seeing investors come in? And Amy touched on the investors coming and uh, buying residential stock. Uh, return on investment is one of the biggest things we've got. Their ability to predict a return on their investment versus going into the stock market with their money is, is pretty dramatic. You can see a, and here lately it's been a 13 to 18% increase per year in your value, but safely 5 to 8% in a normal course of the year, your investment grows. So these investors who have hundreds of millions of dollars to, to, to deploy say, I'm going to build a subdivision and I'm going to rent that subdivision. And I know every year my subdivision is at least going to gain in value 5 to 8%, much less the markets we've had where they've gone <clears throat> a great deal higher. Uh, the second thing is um, the, uh, we talked about the appreciation of the, of the of the uh, investment, the predictability of income. You know that you're going to have X percent vacancy, maybe it's 5 to 10 percent, but you know that money is going to be coming every month, every year. And then the ability to offset profit. So they have expenses to maintain the homes, uh, they have the ability to write off depreciation, so their investment return is actually improved because they have all these things they can write off when they're maintaining the homes. So that's why you see a lot of uh, builders building for rent only, and it's a trend we see. I think it'll, I think it'll run a life cycle because, in my opinion, being in banking 30 years and, and, and having the good fortune to have had a couple of rental properties, good fortune, bad fortune, is about 10 years in when you're replacing HVAC systems, 10 years in when you're replacing water heaters, roofs, 
that investment may become a little bit more challenging. Just as us homeowners, we have to do those things to maintain our homes. When these, when these remote owners, these hedge funds out of New York say, I've got 30 roofs I have to replace, finding the material, finding the labor, doing it timely, they, they may change their mind. So I think this is a trend we'll see run its course. Now, I wasn't exactly sure what uh, Commissioner Robinson was going to want of me, so I also prepared just a quick conversation about uh, being prepared to buy a home. And I didn't know. I, I took it seriously. I wore my camo today since you said this is boot camp, so I've got my camo shirt on. But I'm going to talk just quickly about uh, preparing to buy a home and mortgage selection tips. Yeah. This room, may, you may not have that need in this room, but your kids, your grandkids, your nieces and nephews may want to know that. So I've got some handouts here if you want to take anything with you. But the three main areas that you should save for when you're beginning to be prepared to buy a home is your down payment. Down payment can range between 0% and 20%, depending on the type of mortgage you select. Okay? And we'll talk a little bit about that. But simple math, if you want to put 3% down on a $300,000 house, you need to save $9,000 to do that. 3% down qualifies you for a lot of different programs. You'll, you'll hear more about that. The second item is closing cost. Closing costs range between 2 and 5% of the mortgage amount you're borrowing. That's your fee to close your fees to close the mortgage. And as Amy can say, you can or Amy can share, you can always ask your seller to pay some of your closing costs if you want to, but you should be prepared to pay those closing costs and oftentimes you roll those into your mortgage. Moving expenses the act of moving, cleaning that house up, immediate repairs needed, uh, deposits on utilities, upgrades, furnishing the house, things like that. So those are your main areas to save for when you begin to plan for buying a home. The second is how much do you, how much can you afford? And there's factors that go into that. The, uh, the, your income, of course, is a big factor. You have the existing debt you have, the amount of down payment you prepare to put into it, your credit score, and the market you need and plan to live in affects pricing. Um, I tell folks, NerdWallet, um, bankrate.com, bank Amy probably has some sources. There are a lot of sources online that can help you per, uh, plan for how much you can afford. Okay. What I tell folks in my mind is I've always heard about 30% of your gross take home can go toward living, go toward your housing, okay? So that's your principal and interest taxes and insurance on a mortgage. About 30% of what you, bring, what you gross uh, are paid every, uh, every month and every year, you can pour toward housing, okay? The third thing to do before you buy is to check and strengthen your credit. Um, your credit score will determine the rate you get on your mortgage, and the better the credit, the better the rate, the, the weaker the credit, the higher the rate, and that's just a, a factor of the risk involved in making the loan. So the better your credit is and the better you plan for that before you go shopping, the better off you'll be. Uh, you can get a free copy of all your credit reports, and there are three bureaus, three main bureaus. There's, there's Experian, Expedia, not Expedia, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, okay? Make time to look at those before you go shopping. Make time to um, contact them about correcting any errors. You'll be surprised there are things that can get under your credit report that you may not be aware of. So take the time. Each of those bureaus will provide you a free report once a year. You can also track your score through those bureaus. So contact them. I also encourage as a banker, lock your credit. Get your credit locked so you don't have somebody coming along and doing anything with your credit. It's real simple. All the bureaus offer a way to do that online. I have mine locked, I've told my son lock his credit. You can unlock it really quickly, but to not do that is just opening yourself up for potential fraud, okay? Now, mortgage selection tips. All right, so mortgage options. There are all kinds of mortgage options depending on where you're at in your life and your life cycle. Conventional mortgages, typically not guaranteed by the government. Some require as little as 3% down. FHA loans are insured by the Federal Housing Administration and allow for down payments as low as 3.5%. Uh, USDA loans, those are guaranteed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they are aimed at more rural housing, and they have some income criterion, but they also have the option of putting uh, very low or no down payments on purchases. VA, VA loans are guaranteed by the Department of Veterans Affairs. They're for current, uh, current serving veterans and qualifying surviving spouses, and they can also require no down payment. So there are options within that. Typically, you hear of a 30-year mortgage, and I tell folks, uh, depending on where you're at in life, a 30-year mortgage is the easiest probably route to go because you can always pay it on a 15-year amortization or a 20-year amortization. You can pay it off quicker, 
but a 30-year mortgage allows you the most flexibility for your payment. It doesn't trap you in a high monthly payment compared to doing it on a 15-year amortization. Right. There are a lot of first-time buyer programs out there. The internet's our friend as far as that goes. Uh, bank rate, Nerd Wallet, Credit Karma, some of those sites are great sites to use to shop those programs. Your favorite hometown realtor, Amy McCoy, can help you with that. Uh, but do your research and you can really get educated about what's available out there. Uh, compare mortgage rates. Most banks will provide you their rates. You can go online and look at them, uh, what the current rates are. And as, as Greg mentioned, you know, rates in the fives, fives and sixes are not bad. I got in banking in 91 when rates were in the nines and tens, so it's not, it's not a bad time to be shopping for homes, and they are affordable if you look at it in a broader sense. Um, one of the questions that Commissioner Robinson said I may want to talk about is like discount points. What are discount points? Discount points are when you pay money to your lender as a percentage of your loan to buy your rate down. Now, why do you do that? Number one, you've got the cash available to do it, if you choose to do it. And maybe you've been trying to shop and rates have just gone up a little bit and you're going to be in that home for a long time, so I'm going to buy that rate back down a little bit. But I don't recommend spending that money unless you plan to be in that home for at least a long enough time to recoup that cash. And typically it's that home that's going to be your, you know, your 20 or 30 year home where you plan to raise your children or where you plan to retire at. So discount points are available. It, it's not always the best thing to do to, to pay that. It depends on your circumstances. Um, Pre-approval versus pre-qualifying. This is when you're going out to shop. Pre-approval means I've given the lender all the information I need to be underwritten. I've given him my tax returns, I've filled out the application, I've given him my source of down payment, and he's underwritten me and he's approved me, he or she's approved me. A pre-qualification letter is basically, here's how much I make, here's the price of house I'm looking for. They don't do any really due diligence on that, but they can provide you a pre-qualification letter. A pre-approval letter will be taken a little bit more seriously from a seller's perspective, as Amy shakes her head and nods her head, that means you've done the due diligence to know that you're a qualified buyer who can buy quickly. So take the time to do that if you can. Um, one of the things I left off over here as far as getting ready to, and, it, and I think about my 23-year-old son when I say this, um, as you prepare to get your credit in line, I tell folks this is a banker, I can't help it, put everything you've got on auto pay. I tell my 23-year-old son, who I look at his account, because he banks with me, like, put your bills on auto pay so you don't have to worry about ever missing that minimum payment. That keeps your credit score in such better shape than trying to rely on doing it yourself. So just a little tip. Um, I'm going to make mine quick because I know we're pressed for time. And so I'll be glad to answer any questions you've got about either trends we see in commercial lending or in trying to look at housing and mortgages. Thank you. Let's give them a hand clap, guys, real quick before we go. <laughs> Mike, so are, are banks healthy overall? Yeah, overall, yes, sir. Overall, yes, sir. We, um, we did a lot of business during, we being the banking industry, did a lot of business during the, uh, the payroll protection program and made a lot of loans. Uh, I personally touched over 1,500 jobs in the Douglas County market with my customers with PPP loans I did. And then those loans have been forgiven, so the SBA has paid us those dollars back. So banks are flush with cash right now. Uh, and they're trying to lend that money out. And you're seeing banks also start to raise rates on deposit accounts to bring more customers and deposits into the bank. Right. So you think, so overall, and Douglas County is healthy for the most part, sounds like? I, I believe so. I believe so. I think we're very healthy, yes. And last question I've got is loans for the most part. You think uh, it's fair? Uh, we always hear the rent lining and things like that that may have been historical. Do you think that we're a fair market here out in Douglas County? I think so. From so, so we we have a lot of ongoing. I mean, and, and it is something they they drill with us about training about you know what redlining has been and and the negative impacts of that. So there's a lot of focus, at least in our organization, about understanding that trend. But I think as far as our market goes, I see a healthy real estate market. Um, I, I'm like Amy. I've been fortunate or unfortunate enough to have some rental property. I sold one earlier this year, and I was able to go from being a a, a landlord renter. I put a home I put a homeowner in the house. I put an FHA. I put a dental hygienist in the house as her first resident. So I was proud to do that. So I say, as far as I think we're a very healthy community. Very good. Thank you, Mike. Again, one more time, thank you so much. I think we're about to go to a break. Ivy, can you? We will be on break until 10 o'clock where our next group of panelists will begin to speak for us. Um, 
We have someone out in the lobby who was doing a raffle. She would like to come in and hand out tickets. I'm not sure um, if she's ready or not, but we will be on intermission until Shifted, shifted 15 minutes. We will be on break for 15 minutes. Thank you. Keep it moving. Sierra, let me know. Welcome back, Douglas County. My name is Kelly Robinson, the Commissioner of the Second District and Vice Chairman of the Douglas County Board of Commissioners. We, we are going into our second part of our, our sixth annual HOA boot camp. And that, that first half, was, it was, we set the right tone. We took, for those who are just joining us online as well as in person, we took a broad look at the housing industry. Again, sometimes you, you've got to diversify your, your platforms. Um, I thought it was important for people to understand what's going on out there in the housing market right, as we begin to evolve. Because again, even if you have a home, you've got to know what's going on with the neighbors, what type of products are coming on down, how are y'all dealing with your um, future land use map. All those things are related, and so again, what I try to do is educate the public, and I was asked the question, why did I do this? Well, it's important. It's all about education, um, just in general. But now this second panel is gonna be really good, because that's really why you're here, HOAs. And I've got a colleague here, and I, I take no credit for this. Um, Marvin Aaron Jr., he's a commissioner out of Fulton County, approached me about six years ago, and um, I think we were at ACCG in Savannah, and I think um, Lisa Cupid, the commissioner of Cobb County, was there at that time. He asked us to join him, and he began to share his own experience about HOAs. And it, and it sparked something to me, like, wait a minute, we got that thing going on here. But he established a platform, um, a very seasoned platform. As a super lawyer, super attorney, I mean, his, his command of this is going to be, you guys are going to be um, enriched and blessed by, by his comprehension of this. Um, I look forward to it. But again, at the end of the day, um, you know, if you think about it, HOAs are what we call, that's a state issue, above my pay grade. It's about my pay grade, I gotta stay in my lane. But we can, you know, we, we can, if you don't regulate, you can, you can educate, and there are things you can do at a local level. And some of the issues that come with that, um, and, and Arrington, I won't even get into it, it's his platform, he'll, he'll shape the whole conversation. I've got a couple other speakers that are gonna be here. Um, we got our Lieutenant Colonel Pounds, we'll talk about crime, um, that's important and stuff. So we, again, this is supposed to be a holistic agenda, um, and so we're gonna balance this thing out for the next two hours. I promise to get you out here by, by, by noon, because we know in Douglas County, we got the rest of our day. We gotta keep it moving. So with that being said, um, Commissioner Marvin Arrington, why don't you just come on up and take this microphone and do what you do, sir. Welcome for coming on board. Let's give him a hand clap, guys. Ahead, Thank sir. you, Brother Robinson. Yes. Uh, my name is Marvin Arrington, Jr. Happy to be here today in Douglas County with Commissioner yeah. Robinson. Yeah. It has been a pleasure to work with him over the last six years. Uh, in 2014, we started uh, the HOA boot camp in South Fulton, which was really at that time, I guess it was unincorporated Fulton County. It is now uh, the city of South Fulton. We had over 300 people come out because they were uh, excited about their HOA. They either love their, what we found is people either love their HOA or they hate it. Uh, and so um, we were having problems in our HOA and we were looking for answers. We found those answers on a website or an app called Nextdoor. But the answers were really in the subdivision next door. The answers were really with the homeowners in the subdivision down the street. And what we found out was that the builders and the developers and the counties and the cities were all talking across subdivision lines. But we as homeowners were not talking across those same subdivision lines. Let me see the hands for people that are on their board. If you're on the board of your HRA, let me see your hand. All right, congratulations and condolences. 
you have signed on for the rest of your life. Because they can't, no one can ever get a quorum. You will be in that position until you die. All right? Um, but seriously, I think we do have a, a presentation on short term rentals, a slideshow, a slide deck, if we could pull that up, please. Um, most HOAs, uh, and HOA is a type of community association. Um, it could be a condo association, right? It could be a mobile home association. It could be a property owners association. The new act that the state has passed is called the POA. Um, so there are different types of community associations, whether that is a HOA or COA or POA or MOA, um, but typically they work the same. Most of them are first and foremost nonprofit, Georgia nonprofit corporations, okay? And then those Georgia nonprofit corporations typically have what they call mandatory membership. You are a member as soon as you sign the line, right? Uh, and you must pay your dues, right? Um, and so one of the things that we tried to do, and certainly thanks to Commissioner Robinson and State Representative William Bodie and State Senator Donzella James, we introduced an act at the state level called the uh, Community Association Protection Act. And so we're gonna need you to reach out to your state legislators because we need rules that will help us govern these 10,000 different communities. So in, in the state of Georgia, there are over 2 million, over 2 million Georgians that live in a community association. And there are over 10,000 community associations. How many different sets of rules do you think there are? I couldn't hear you. 10,000 different sets of rules, one for each community association. No wonder there's so much confusion. Nobody knows what the rules are, right? And if you move from one place to the next, there's a whole different set of rules. And in fact, when the board transitions from one board to the next board, the, the next board might interpret those rules differently and implement and execute those rules differently. Um, so we talked about mandatory membership. There are two things with your HOA. Uh, number one is the Georgia Nonprofit Corporation, right? Number two is the Declaration of Protective Covenants. Now some people just call it the Declaration, some people call it the Covenants. The long formal title is Declaration of Protective Covenants. That is a contract between you as a homeowner and the association. And you and the association are both bound by the terms of that contract. You hear people talk about the articles of association. If you have any corporation, you have bylaws and articles of incorporation. So what those do, what the bylaws do, the bylaws govern how the company will operate. How do you elect officers? When do elections occur? What are the terms for those officers, okay? The Declaration of Protective Covenants governs the land. It governs the use and land restrictions imposed on the land. So let's assume that this is a 50 acre room and I am the declarant. I went out and bought this 50 acre lot and I am imposing declarations. I say no one can eat Chick-fil-A in this room. Right, that's one of the restrictions. I, I declare no one can eat Chick-fil-A in this room. It's a use restriction. So if you come into this room, right, and the example with your, uh, with your home could be no basketball goals, right? or the basketball goal must be 90 degrees perpendicular to the street, right? And I don't know, it gets confusing sometimes, but those type of rules are put in place by the declaration, by the declarant 
through the Declaration of Protective Covenants. And so it governs all the rules and restrictions for the land included in that subdivision. Uh, and so, uh, again, nonprofit corporation uh, and uh, Declaration of Protective Covenants runs with the land. So those are kind of the background things. Again, most of these HOAs, community associations, are uh, m have mandatory membership. All right, and so there are, if, how many people, do we have anyone who lives in condo, condominium? So condos are governed, we got one over there. Condos are governed by, uh, in, in the state of Georgia, they are governed by the Condominium Act, okay? The Condominium Act. Most HOAs, there, there is no HOA Act. There is no HOA Act in the state of Georgia. In the state of Georgia, HOAs are governed, one, by the Nonprofit Corporation Code, and then two, they are also governed by the Real Estate Code. And so if you are a board member on an HOA in the state of Georgia, you are charged with the task of interpreting number one the nonprofit corporation code number two the real estate code and you have to read those two codes together in order to apply them to your HOA and how the, it should be governed the legislator created the condominium act to kind of shortcut that because they saw problems with the fact of not really having that so condos have their own act Right, and they can foreclose on you uh, a lot quicker than an HOA can. Um, and they have their own set of rules that are peculiar to condos because they're in a condo, there's a lot of shared space, right? In most HOAs, you have single family detached housing like the lady was talking about earlier. Um, Ms. Duncan. Uh, and so in condos, most of those are attached there may be an elevator, there may be one roof over the entire building, and so um, they have their own act. And the new thing that the Georgia legislature has created is called the POA, the Property Owners Association Act. Now, this is an attempt to bring HOAs under their own set of rules. The problem is most of the HOAs were established before the POA Act was adopted, so most HOAs are not subject to the POA. Now, there are certain groups of people, well, let me say this. If you are wearing your board member hat, you probably would like the POA better than your established HOA. The POA Act allows you to collect money as the association. It allows you to collect, and it gives you more options and remedies for collection, okay? If you are wearing your homeowner hat, you might not like it so much. So it depends on which hat you're wearing, uh, because if you're the homeowner, you may not want the association to have more options on how to collect, all right? But the whole purpose of the HOA and the association if you are a board member, is to help protect the value of your home and everyone else around you. One of the things that I would like to remind you, and I'll get into it, see we've got the slide deck up now, uh, but one of the things I want to say to you is, as board members, just remember this, uh, you are in charge, not the management company, not the attorneys. They don't live in your subdivision. Okay, these are your neighbors. Try to find a neighborly resolution. You can collect the money and be neighborly at the same time. The law firms, and I'm a lawyer, right? The law firms, they're interested in making as much money as they can, right? So I'm not necessarily disparaging them, right? I mean, hey, they've got to make a living too. But for example, in our subdivision, before we took over and got elected, they paid the law firm $2,000 
to collect $70 from a lady that was in bankruptcy and no longer lived in the subdivision. Now, maybe John Whelan can afford that because he's John Whelan and he sold a lot of houses. I can't afford to pay somebody $2,000 to collect $70. I just can't. And so what we did was we found, we tried to be neighborly. We gave everybody 30 days. We waived all late fees and fines for 30 days. We, we, we waived all late fees and fines for 30 days. We waived all late fees and fines for 30 days uh, in order to give everyone an opportunity to get caught up. And then when that 30 days was up, we waived it again for another 30 days. And when that 30 days was up, we waived it again for another 30 days. And we said, hey, just work out a payment plan. Now, after those three 30-day periods, that's when we called the lawyers, right? Um, but we tried to, again, work it out in a neighborly fashion on the front end. After we took over, Mr. Driscoll here uh, and I founded the HOA Alliance together. Certainly, please check out our website at HOAalliance.com. Dot org. We are a 501c3 organization. Uh, we started the HOA Alliance uh, again because we just wanted to help uh, others. There were homeowners who helped us in our HOA, and so we were looking to uh, pay it forward and to help other homeowners. Uh, if we could do the next slide, I'm going to go into the short term rentals and I will try to abbreviate this. Uh, Short-term rentals is a real hot topic now, right? Airbnb, VRBO, the internet has created new vehicles for earning, right? I have one client who rented out a 100-unit building, paying $1,600 per unit, but he's making $4,600 per unit because he's renting it out nightly through Airbnb and VRBO, right? So short-term rental is typically a rental that's less than 12 months, but it could be 24 hours, it could be 48 hours, it could be a week, a month, or more. Um, next slide, please. Um, we talk about here the different community association types. I think you all, we went through that. Um, Declaration of Protective Covenants, which limits the uses and sets the rules for the land, right? So even if you sell your house, those rules don't go away when you sell your house. The next owner is still subject to those set of rules. Next slide, please. Um, most declarations uh, state that the homes are for single family use only. And so governments have had a hard time interpreting some of these rules because if you are renting your home out to different families in a month, is that a single family residential use? I don't really know that that's a single family residential use. But now we have governments that are implementing rules um, to govern these short term rentals, right? City of Atlanta just passed a rule that says you can't have more than two. Well, all people are going to do is set up a different company and put them in two different, have two rentals per company, right? Um, so I don't know that that really addresses the issue. Um, but a lot of different organizations, number one, they want people to register. They want to know where are these short-term rentals. What they really want, what governments really want, and uh, Douglas County, I'm a Fulton County Commission, what governments want and cities want, they want the motel hotel tax to come, right? They want that money added so that they can get their piece. Um, but arguably, you could be in the city of Atlanta, register with the city of Atlanta, your Airbnb, and you try to rent it out, and then your HOA comes back and sends you a letter saying, hey, you're in violation. We, we don't allow leases less than 12 months. We don't allow short-term rentals. So you could be in compliance with your city or county government, but not be in compliance with your HOA board or your HOA rules, or in particular, your Declaration of Protective Covenants. Um, if you're on the board and you do not have any rules, if your Declaration of Protective Covenants does not 
address rentals, but you're having a problem that you want to address. As a board, you can adopt any rule you want to. It may not be as strong as a rule that is in the Declaration of Protective Covenants, but it is still a rule. And so you can adopt rental restrictions as long as it does not conflict with your Declaration of Protective Covenants. Next slide, please. Um, these are just some of the cases. It basically talks about you need to have a reason, right? You, need to, you can't just say we're not going to not allow short-term rentals. There has to be a reason that you're doing that. There has to be purpose behind it, right? So, hey, we need to, if you're a board member, you need to, we need to know who all the renters are so that if something occurs, we can contact them, right? We need to be able to contact whoever's living in, in, in the home and be able to talk to them, right? Um, again, if you live, uh, you know, on the beach somewhere in a, that type of community, you might love Airbnb and VRBO. But if you're in a quiet neighborhood and the house on the corner is a big party house and there's a lot of traffic and a lot of noise, you might not be so much in favor of it, right? And, and, and one of the things that we talk about when we look at HOAs and community associations is a balancing between individual rights and group rights, right? You're, it's your home, it's your property, you can do whatever you want to. Uh, when you live in a community association, you give up some of your individual rights for the rights of the group, right? All right, next slide. Um, again, declaration is a contract between the owners and the community. We also list some case law here. Um, the HOA restrictions are typically enforceable as long as the restriction promotes a legitimate purpose and is not forbidden by statute. Um, so the starting point when deciding if an HOA has the authority to ban short-term rentals is to look at the declaration. The declaration is, is for lack of a better term, it's the, it's the Bible for your HOA, right? It is the source of information. Uh, if the declaration prohibits rentals short term along, then the HOA can likely enforce the prohibition unless there's some other reason why. Next slide, please. Um, the laws vary in different states. We, you know, because Airbnb and VRBO are new, we're just now seeing to see legislation, right? And then we're also just now seeing case law. So what happens when we don't have case law in the state of Georgia, then you start looking to other states for case law, for precedents, right? So Arizona, California, Florida are states where they have a lot of condos and a lot of short-term rentals. And so they may have different types. Uh, they may have different rules, but they also provide, looking to those courts in those cases helps provide guidance uh, for us here in the state of Georgia. Uh, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Uh, residential versus commercial use, right? So if you're renting out, this goes back to whether there's a single family residential use or not, right? Uh, so if, the, if you're on the board of the HOA and you're trying to push back against short-term rentals because of the traffic and pollution issues, um, or, um, then you, know, you want to be able to say, hey, we have this in place uh, and that is not a residential use. The renting of your property to different multiple families over multiple nights is a commercial use. It is, and, and even if it is not commercial use, it's not single family residential use, right? Uh, and so you have to look at those different things. Um, some states favor homeowners more, right? So it depends on where you are. Next slide, please. Um, and adopting and enforcing short-term rental restrictions. We talked about that. If you're on the board, you can do it. Um, board members, raise your hand again if you're on the board of the HOA. Does your board have E and O insurance? Yes or no? Don't know. All right. That is the first thing you need to know. 
Uh, if you are on the board, you want your HOA to have E and O insurance, errors and omissions insurance. It is errors and omissions insurance for directors and officers. Sometimes it is called E and O, sometimes it is called D and O, but it is errors and omissions insurance for directors and officers. Uh, so please make sure if you are on the board that you have that. Why? Because that is the insurance that makes sure that if you get sued, no one can come after you or your money or your house. Uh, the insurance covers your defense, okay? Uh, and so you are, that way you are allowed to serve in this volunteer role that you've signed up for for the rest of your life um, without uh, any implications or, and making sure that you are covered. Uh, yes, sir. So there is only one thing, but some people refer to it's errors and omissions insurance for directors and officers. All right, some people call it DNO, some people call it ENO. Doesn't matter what you call it, make sure you got it because that is what protects you in your role as a board member. Um, yes, ma'am. No, so liability insurance covers the property. Liability insurance covers the clubhouse and the pool, right? Liability insurance covers the common areas, right? It is property insurance, but the board members need E and O or D and O insurance to make sure that their actions are covered so that if, if you make a mistake as a board member, it can't come back and really harm you because you're covered, uh, with, you've got insurance to cover that. And so if you're on a board, absolutely make sure you have that. I'm gonna stop there and let Mr. Driscoll talk uh, briefly. Uh, again, we, he and I founded the HOA Alliance just very briefly, because uh, I know we've got other people coming up. But uh, thank you again, and I'll be around to answer any questions um, if you have any. Thank you. Just to, uh, my name is Correll Driscoll. I just want to keep it brief. I'll just elaborate on some of the things uh, Commissioner Arrington spoke to. Uh, when we talk about the ENO and DNO, you're not just protecting yourself as a board, you're protecting your family. Uh, because some people are very litigious and they'll find a way to get to you. They will sue everything around you. I, I would even protect my dog if I were you, right? As, as, uh, and I've been through so many litigations in five years that forever thing never worked for me. When it was time to roll off, I rolled off. So um, I believe in a two-term limit so that we can allow other people with different ideas to get in and, and work on that. Uh, I've, I've witnessed some people who get on the board and they camp out like it's a 30-year career. So just be weary of that. Uh, I am very suspicious of any board member that wants to manage a community in isolation, right? So what that means is that they are not working with other groups or even people within the community. Um, a, a lot of the strategies that I see that are inappropriate against board members is that you will always hear the claim about you're still in money. So it is a good practice to have that insurance. If you are on a board and you do, do not have ENO, DNO, why are you serving? You're volunteering for free. Now you want to volunteer to pay for your litigation for free. No, no sir, no ma'am. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm single side deaf, so speak up. Yeah. What, what uh, I would you recommend suggest? you. I'm sorry, he, he could clarify your question. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, what limit uh, do you suggest for an ENO insurance? Okay, this is where you engage your insurance agent. Reach out. We started with State Farm because we went through so many litigations, we had to move on to another party. Insurance is expensive, right? I'll even recommend that you all get that, what they call it, that umbrella insurance. Uh, on top of what you have with the board as your board service because you will get that letter when litigation start where they would say at any time they can avoid paying for your fees so do not I repeat take your service as a board member lightly and then I'll transition into this last part I believe in continuing education and that should be mandatory for all board members 
I mean, if you look at your commissioners, you look at your council people, your legislators, they all are mandato have mandatory training on their role. Why are we allowing board members to impact positively or negatively any members of their community without some form of continuing education. And that's one of the things that I want to push at the Capitol, making that a requirement. So hopefully we'll get some things done. Uh, you may get a nice email inviting you all to participate in the process of encouraging our representatives to take a look at this and encourage the passing of that type of bill. Right? Any other questions for, I I'll use your role name, Attorney Arrington. <laughs> Well, thank you again um, from the HOA Alliance. Again, our website is hoaalliance.org. Uh, we have monthly memberships available as low as $5 a month uh, for those that want to help us uh, pay it forward to other homeowners. Uh, so thank you so much. Commissioner Carthen, Sierra, from the 3rd District, is she out there? Let's see if we can put her, see if we can put her on the microphone. While we're doing this, Allison Duncan, can you come to the front, and, and, and this will be good as a transition, Commissioner Carthen may want to say something, but we did some local legislation ourselves to the very point they talked about. What can I do locally? I get that's a state issue. I'm with y'all guys, wherever y'all need me to be, I'll be down there. Uh, I will go over there and, and help advocate for this. But what can we do as legislators locally? What we can do is, we, through our planning and zoning and through our, our local unified development code, there are certain things that we can do to sort of move it a little bit. To, to um, Commissioner, Car um, Commissioner Arrington's point, but some things, if you're already on the books, you sort of grandfather from the old system. But, but we still you get to push it. You know, you, you still put a, like, well, look, all I know going forward, but also you can advocate this, but if you're not in compliance, if you don't produce your financials, if you don't put your elections out there, if you're not inclusive, then that needs to be known. You need to advocate. I mean, they put us on Facebook for everything else, but let's talk about that community don't do righteous, right? I mean, you, you got to bring exposure to it, right? So, real, is Commissioner Carthen here? No. Good morning. I'm here. Good morning, Commissioner Carthen. Welcome. Sorry. You got the fork. I got Allison up front. Let's go talk about the legislation. You want to facilitate this? Sure. So I did not prep uh, Allison this, this morning regarding this, but uh, she was very crucial in helping me to uh, help uh, some constituents down in Holly Springs with um, so-called party houses. And she doesn't like to call them party houses, but uh, but we, we, we wanted to address the, that um, that somewhat it started to become rogue and, and it was so bad in Douglas County that I don't know if people remember uh, last year when um, some kids rented out a home and one of the kids got killed. And so these types of things we don't want happening in Douglas County, you know, or anywhere, but we wanted to see how could we combat this. So Allison, if you could kind of lead the discussion just to kind of help other homeowner associations know what we put in place in Douglas County. And thank you, Commissioner Robinson, for allowing me to do this. Yes, thank you. Sure thing, and thank you. Um, and I, I think this is a great place to pick up uh, in regard to the conversation about short-term rentals because it is a big conversation that is going on and um, and so in Douglas County we, um, we we do appreciate the Board of Commissioners for hearing uh, the feedback from the community and from the citizens uh, they said hey we want you to get out ahead of this and so they have allocated resources for us to work with a third-party vendor and that vendor has identified all of the properties that are actively being listed on uh, platforms like Airbnb, VRBO, uh, HomeAway um, and those rental platforms um, and so that has enabled us to send letters to, to all of those platforms, excuse me, to all of those properties and say to them, you may not have been aware, but there is a requirement uh, for you to go through zoning action. That's a special use permit in Douglas County. Um, and I think that this is an important step and I will tell you why. 
Um, so number one, I think that it allows that homeowner to realize that there's more to it, right, than they may realize. Um, and so I appreciate the Douglas County Sheriff's Department. They've given us some great feedback that we can then share with homeowners to make sure they're thinking through what this actually means when they're putting their homes on these platforms. Um, and so, so we want to make sure that the people who are doing this understand that there is a liability and there are consequences for their actions. Um, number two, we, because this is a zoning process, it creates transparency in the community, right? We want to make sure that the neighborhood has the opportunity to come and speak in favor and in opposition so that they understand that there's going to be transient populations moving through their neighborhood so that we can keep this a transparent process. And number three, we want to make sure that we're protecting the traveling public who may be going onto these platforms and they may be assuming that we're doing our job at the county to make sure that these properties are compliant with all building codes, life safety codes, and things of that nature. Um, so, so that is our purpose in Douglas County for regulating them to make sure that the process is open and transparent and that folks are complying with the codes that they need to be complying with. Um, so we, we started sending letters to the units that were identified um, and we've been working through a process of bringing those units into compliance. Um, so again, this is a public hearing process as folks come in and apply. Once they make the decision that yes, they want to go through the process, um, they want to come in compliance, it's a public hearing process. Um, if anybody has specific questions about your neighborhood um, or units in your neighborhood or if you need me to come and speak specifically with your HOA, I would be more than happy um, to do that. Uh, but, but so far, we have been pleased with the response that we've been getting um, uh, in, in, in response to, to doing this program. Um, and so I'll pause right there and see if there's any questions or anything else that I can add in regard to that. No, that was good. And again, just this highlight, just that, that that information is available for the citizens that are here listening online or in person. You're available to go more detail about that, correct, for HOAs? All right. Second part of the, what else did we do by, by way of transparency? Share about that. Uh, so one of the other things that we did in regard to transparency for HOAs is that we have amended our unified development code so that every new uh, project that is approved, so a uh, condominium project, a uh, single family project, any new project that is approved, at the time of final plat approval, we are requiring um, that they put in place uh, certain reporting aspects um, of the business of the HOA. Um, and so that includes financial reporting, that includes elections, um, that includes advertising when elections will take place. Um, so when new projects come online, we make that language a requirement as a part of their covenants, right? So, so we have to receive a copy of the, 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 the covenants, um, and, and that is something that is, is, is reviewed and approved as a part of the final plat approval. Um, and so all of that language in regards to transparency for financial reporting elections and things of that nature um, is now required for every new project approved in Douglas County. No, thank so. you for that, for Ms. Duncan. And, and to Mr. Driscoll's point about, about transparency, this is key. If I don't produce my financials, I can go to jail as, a, as an elected official. Every year, every quarter, depends on the election, we have to produce our financials for our campaigns, right? So we're held to this standard. You guys are unregulated to run these things, but it's still a standard. How do you not share what's going on? So we, 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 we introduce here locally, like, no, you guys are going to upload your financials like we do. It's transparency. You shouldn't have to hunt for that. You should know when the election Think about if we didn't hold an election. Well, I don't want to talk about that. I'm not trying to be political. About elections. When you're subverting the election process, we don't have a quorum. You can, I, 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 never miss, I don't miss meetings. If you're a board member, if you're an officer, you've got to show up. You took up that. And so one of the things that we're trying to encourage in our county, like, look, guys, if y'all going to do this, do it right. Don't, don't handle your, own, your neighbors like that. Don't move on them. The, the, the power y'all have with those liens and stuff like, guys, come on. I can't move on my citizens. I can't take your property. It's a, it's a process by way which we go about doing that. And I, I think you guys get it. We're just saying that we heard you and we responded accordingly, but I'm going to keep this moving. Uh, Commissioner Carthen, thank you so much. I've got to stay on task right here. Ms. Duncan, thank you so much. And so now I'm just going to shift gears here. I've got to keep moving to stay on time. Can we introduce Ms. Forte, please? Shandrin Forte is the president of PO Solutions Incorporated. Shandrin has over 18 years of niche expertise in developing and leading neighborhood associations and expanded PO Solutions portfolio into building and facilities maintenance and financial recovery services. She attended Alabama State University and also is a Georgia real estate broker, a certified professional community association manager, and an association manager specialist with the National Board of Community Association Managers. Ms. Forte graduated from the SBA Emerging Leaders Program 
and is now appointed board member of the Douglas County Economic Development Authority and also serves as a board member for the Douglas County Chamber of Commerce and Elevate Douglas. Chandran is also a proud member of the National Coalition of 100 Black Women, Northwest Georgia and West Georgia Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated. Please welcome Chandran Forte. Mike Shea. Good morning, good morning, or we in the afternoon already. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here again, Chandra Forte. Commissioner Robinson, thank you. Uh, Attorney Arrington, thank you, thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, please keep me on task, because I, I promise you I eat, sleep, and breathe this thing, so I can probably talk all day, all right? Um, to some of the points, and I'll kind of go back from our earlier portion of our platform, you heard from, I think it was Greg with the, you know, Homework Builders Association, and even with uh, Amy in speaking, um, one thing that was glaring was that a solvent association, a solvent, healthy, productive association is going to be the catalyst for stabilizing, you know, our, our neighborhoods, our, our communities, uh, you know, here in Douglas County, all right? Um, having done this for, you know, 18 years, we've seen uh, quite, quite things change. We are definitely in the midst of a peculiar time and market perspective. Um, board members, for those of you that raise their hand, and even from just a localized, just day-to-day -day perspective, just coming off of COVID, HOA and condo living in space was already uh, one that was frowned upon. You said you either you love it or you hate it. Well, that's amplified times 10 now coming off of COVID. It seems that everyone is either raging, you know, from having just been sitting at home, looking out, um, raging about their communities to um, board members being frustrated, um, limited funds coming in, inabilities to be able to, to do certain things, um, and quite frankly, in some situations where you have a, 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 an abundance of just uh, negligence that is occurring, how how do we kind of navigate between through and all of that? All right, so. Financial solvency, let me kind of start there and I'm gonna work with, please indulge me for a moment. A few years ago, maybe probably about a year or so ago, you guys may have heard about the, the tragedy down in Florida, Surfside condos, those condos that failed and so many different lives were lost. That is impacting us as an association, you know, from an industry perspective significantly, all right? As related to our financials and what we do and how we do in deed restricted communities, how we budget, are we planning, are we taking 10% of those dues that are collected uh, annually, are we putting them into a reserve account? How we're funding for those contingencies? Extremely important. All the way to the tune at this point where you're seeing the information is circulating at, at state level. You know what, before um, Amy shared about uh, state bodies, because I, again, as a broker, commission real estate, those FHA loans and EVA, you know, trying to purchase in the communities, the association financial disposition and that disclosure is one of the things that we have to provide as managing agents on behalf of that association to help that closing move along. Here of recent, if those budgets are not showing clear indicators where that association is funding from a reserve perspective and saving, they're denying those loans. If they're showing where, hey, if, if we don't have X amount of maintenance that's been budgeted for, and moving along and we've got money sitting over here, they are denying those loans. What does that say to us, all right? In addition to that, they're looking for uh, reserve studies. And this was particularly, you would see these in condominiums all of the time. Well, now you've got this happening on our, just our, our standard HOA, our homeowner associations. As, as Mr. Arrington was, uh, Attorney Arrington was sharing, you know, for here, talking about the POA and the difference between uh, the Condominium Act versus if you're just a, a HOA here, you know, in the state of Georgia and how it's governed, you know, uh, the Condominium Act and condos, they, they tend to have a, a whole nother tougher level of just restrictions because they have so much more in many instances to maintain from your roofs to your sidings to not just pretty much everything on the exterior that you see as related to a condominium. The likelihood is that the association is going to be responsible for that as opposed to an HOA where you're just talking about just the common assets, you know, maybe your pool, your pool clubs houses, you know, your, your front entrance and signs and, and to that extent. But it's, it's changing. You know, we were talking about lives laws and how, how um, a board of directors is moving it along to collect, to make sure that the monies are coming in. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying this is all about the money. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hopefully kind of 
move us along the thought process in terms of how one thing is connected to the next and the next, all right? So if we're looking at this from the perspective of, um, you know, we're coming and, and we don't have the money to do. You know we've got an issue in that instance in Florida, they were preparing, they knew they had this issue and they were saving and had been going through the process of, of uh, special assessing and going along that way. Um, but it, it wasn't enough soon enough and didn't happen quick enough. And as a result, lives were lost. That DNO insurance that was referenced there earlier is so very important. You've got your, your liabilities, your property, your DNO. You equally now, uh, I would recommend from a crime perspective, cyber, because we've got so much happening right now on social media. Um, I'm bringing us to our rogue uh, kind of board members here, but equally, if they are out there and putting out bad information, things get out, that cyber security and, and, and coverage there, that helps you in that aspect. So that is a very important thing to have. But equally, um, for some of our smaller communities that may be 50 and under and you're not, you know, not so heavily um, from a financial disposition and you have to do things voluntarily or you want to, hey, put this committee together to go kind of do these things, you can get a level of a workers' comp policy as well. And that's the very nominal, about $500 a year just to kind of help cover in that aspect if you're doing something and you got somebody on the front entrance, they mess up, step in a pothole or something to that extent. So they're very, off, you know, those coverages, insurance is very, very, very important. As a spinoff of, you know, uh, this Surfside uh, condo issue, the insurance market, now we're seeing our policies about 32% higher. And that's period, point blank, 32% higher. And that the reason is, is again, because of the level of liability that comes along with it, all right? So as board members and just in service, it is extremely important that you're covered. If you are in fact making those decisions and you're executing in good faith and within the scope of what your documents allow and afford you to do, that defense coverage will in fact pick up, pick up to protect you in that aspect, all right? So, and having that, it's not just there saying, hey, it's gonna be just this all out cart and this defense will be provided. You have to still be acting and operating within the scope of your authorities to do so, all right? So we have our governing documents, you know, which are covenants and bylaws. So our covenants are gonna speak to the land, your use restrictions. Our bylaws, they're gonna speak to the operations, the organization, the board of directors in itself, how the actual execution kind of from a parliamentary process goes, you know, your Robert's rules of order and, and what that looks like. And Prior to, you know, yes, your covenants have to be recorded in your land records. Your bylaws do not. That's one thing that I'm excited about that's happening here in Douglas County from the code perspective in terms of looking at that. But basically that's saying, hey, we need to make sure that these bylaws are intact or in place because that's where you're going to have those uh, responsibilities for your board members in terms of when your meetings are actually should be take, when they take place. Um, that annual budget, how you're required to provide that to the membership if you want to contest it as a membership and what that process looks like. Uh, for members' rights, you know, if in fact you've got board members that are not operating or, or being uh, with a level of full transparency, um, what that process looks like to go through from a special partition, partition perspective to go in as a collective body to come back and, and be able to hold those members accountable. I, I always want to say there is never, never, never a valid reason to not comply with your association. Never, never a reason to not pay, never, never a reason to not comply. When you do that, you render yourself powerless if in fact you are faced in, in, in a position where um, I, I have board members that may be on a specific ego trip or, or I, working in isolation, I think you kind of shared there are some things happening from a suspect, you know, kind of suspicious perspective, when you're not compliant, you're just kind of sitting there and kind of creating to what they're already may or may not be doing, okay? So from a compliance perspective, I always gotta go and start saying, hey, yes, you gotta pay, make your voice be heard, because on the other side of that is get in there and serve, you know, because that, that's the other side of it. If you are in compliant, you're reading and being knowledgeable, familiar with what your governing documents afford you to do as a membership collectively, then there you go. It's about the execution of that because in many instances when you're talking about this, when you are 
not in compliance, at that point, your vote becomes moot. And uh, in many instances, you're, you're unable to serve in that capacity, okay? So the, the next piece, um, short-term rentals, yeah. Big deal, uh, so, so, so many communities. Um, Amy, you was actually you know, kind of sharing earlier. Um, the trend, I don't know about you guys, but we're seeing like a lot of younger, you know, between the, the rentals um, and just younger purchases, uh, purchasers in neighborhoods. And they're coming in with a vengeance. I know we got Melinzi, all these different names, but essentially just the thought process and the mentality from an, an industry perspective, what we've been seeing. And so the demands, the demands have been just enormous, egregious and, and rude. I think everyone at this point is stressed, anxious, over the top. So the delivery, the request are, are, are very, very aggressive. Let me say that. And, and it's caused a lot of frustration of our board members from our board members. So in that aspect, um, understanding your docs is very important. Let me, let me go here with regard to short-term rental because I wanna give a few recommendations on um, if in fact you don't have any county support or uh, legislation, you know, things that are in place to help you because it works better is if you have a tag team approach towards your short-term rentals. You know, all of these sites have gotten a lot creative where they, they, they post things, you know, not until you purchase them, you know, make a reservation. So for some communities we've you know, gone through, they set up you know, kind of dummies accounts and go through and they do the bookings to verify so that we can come back and do those violations um, and moving those along and over through it to the attorney. Um, others, um, if you do have some level of uh, a leasing uh, cap or provisions there, so in your covenants, if you have let's say six months or 12 months, if you've already got those provisions there, Yes, you can certainly expand on those policies and what that looks like as a board of directors around, yes, we want a copy of your lease. Yes, we want you to do this permit, you know, this application to let us know that you're gonna be doing these things each year. Um, in fact, coupled with that, if you have the authority to specifically assess, you can equally apply a charge. We have neighbors that do that, um, communities that do that each year as well, where they apply a charge on that piece because in many instances, you know, if you've got these larger institutionalized investors, these companies, um, sometimes they only understand when you, when you talk money or hit them in the, in the pockets. So you make it pretty healthy. Um, so we have some where if they have initiation fees and the authority at board level, they've taken that for investors because of the amount of work that happens on the other side. And they've raised that at least at about $10,000 to deter them, you know, um, in terms of, hey, we maybe don't want to necessarily do this because we know when we have communities that where, where the members own and occupy, we're talking a more vested stake and a more vested interest, okay? Um, and I don't know, maybe we'll get some questions here just on board conflict, but let me just, you know, kind of say this here. Um, the membership uh, elects your board of directors. Your board of directors, once elected, typically it's gonna be within about 10 days of that, of that annual meet, elects your officers, all right? Um, those officer roles, yes, they're specific about pres, tres, VP, et cetera, in terms of the duties, but ultimately the decisions are made there by that majority. It is extremely uh, critical if you're having some challenges to know and read your bylaws, to understand um, what that process looks like for the membership to collectively come in and call that special meeting, to bring those individuals to the table, um, and having members at that point ready and prepared to assume those new board, those board seats, okay? But again, being financial, fiscally compliant is what will get you there. All right, so there, there, you know, is this exchange, you know, so we don't want this, you know, hey, we, we need these things to happen. We want this, 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 but you're not financially contributing or you are, you know, out of compliance from an architectural standpoint and just kind of, you know, adding to those added, you know, issues uh, that makes that argument, uh, you know, uh, sustained, you know, if even if you have, you know, board members that are operating, you're not above, not above board. So um, I'm gonna stop right there because I can I can go down so many different rabbit holes. Because uh, that's fine. <laughs> um, I, I'll, you. Commissioner, I don't know if you entertain questions or we're gonna do it at the end. Things. We're gonna do it at the end. A absolutely. Any any yeah. questions? Yes, ma'am. Repeat so, the question so it can be recorded and heard. 
Got you. So if I'm, I'm hearing you're saying as a homeowner and you want to special, uh, call it, do a special petition to uh, have a meeting, call your board of directors in, how, how do you know who's current? That's the kicker. That's information that you won't have because that, that's the level of confidentiality that's gonna be reserved at board level because it is still a business. So just like you wouldn't want your credit kind of report put out there and everyone seeing it, you, the association you know, cannot do that. So a good rule of thumb, you know, if you're gonna petition, petition all because once you, you know, call, you know, uh, um, again, what that number looks like is gonna be, again, guided by your bylaws. That is presented typically uh, a percentage of the members Go for them all, you know, and you present that for that specific purpose. If it's to remove a board member, X, Y, Z, you want to list them out. However, you know, signatures, their addresses, again, the owner of record and submitting. If that is a managing agent already into play or, or even that board, they're going to verify in terms of those signatures from an eligibility perspective. You hit the numbers, that meeting has, you know, has to be called. So if you're working with, you know, uh, if there's a, it's my hope that is a, a reputable managing agent somewhere in the mix there. Upon delivery of that, they will and should make sure that that meeting is called accordingly for that purpose. All right. Sure. She's doing an awesome job. I just want to add some value. Um, I blogged on a request doing an open books and review. Uh, I'll make sure I share that with you all where you have a template to follow, but you have to make sure you review your declaration. It outlines where members can request that information. And what I've learned from my five years of service is that you are entitled to that information, but it's not a good practice for the board to post it. So put in that request, request those records, keep your eye on it, and I would also do the same thing with enforcement. Yeah, and that's a great point too because that nonprofit code, some may think that it's all inclusive when you submit an open records request, but it isn't. You have to be very specific with the type and how you submit that request right. with the specific information that you can get at that time. Great. Hey, just briefly, typically, again, the answer is it's in your declaration or your bylaws, right? Uh, but typically, you have to have at least 25% of homeowners in the association to call a special meeting, uh, particularly for the removal of a board member, and you have to express that that is the purpose of the meeting. But that 25% isn't enough because when you get to the meeting, you have to have 51% in order to remove them. So be mindful of that. Also, just briefly, uh, the state of Georgia received $354 million for mortgage assistance as a result of the American Rescue Plan. Uh, that money is out there and it not only helps you pay mortgage, but if you are behind on your HOA fees, you can apply for that money in the state. HOA fees and utilities are also included. 354 million. Good stuff, thank you for that. Thank you guys. Let's give them a hand clap real quick. All right, we're, gonna, we're almost, we're at the turn right now. We're gonna keep this going. Uh, we talked about insurance and the need to protect uh, ourselves as officers and directors, um, errors and omission, but now but there's, there's a practical part. And as directors, you guys have to appropriate funds, just like I do. How much money are you going to put into something? Well, now the next guest speaker is our Lieutenant Colonel Pounds from the Department of um, Douglas County Sheriff's Department to talk about the physical part, protecting you as a person, protecting your property. And so I think he's going to shed some light because in Douglas County, that's as important. Right, we're, 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 we're the sheriff, uh, and, and how important he is to, to the mix of this. So, Lieutenant Colonel Pound, sir, can you come on down and take the microphone? Ivy. Tavares Pounds was born and raised in Villarica and attended Villarica High School, graduating in 1997 with a scholarship to play football at Auburn State University. While playing football, he pursued his law enforcement career goal and graduated from Auburn in 2001 with a BA in criminology. He became employed with the Douglas County Sheriff's Office in 2003 as a jailer. During his tenure with the Sheriff's Office, he worked his way up from an entry level position and was promoted through the ranks becoming the division commander over the detention center. In 2022, he was appointed to his current position as Lieutenant Colonel. As a Lieutenant Colonel, he manages two majors who are responsible for 10 divisions in that agency, along with his responsibility to oversee the managed operations of the entire Sheriff's Department. He 
he personally assists in the hiring process of each new applicant. Please welcome Tavarius Pounds. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson, for having us so that we can shed some light on this uh, on, on the crime in the county. So I've been here for 19 years, and I've seen this thing change, this county grow. And, and the things that I have seen, especially in the sheriff's office, is that this was a profession at one time that people wanted to be in, to be able to serve and to protect their communities. With some of the recent things that happened over the years, this is not such a popular profession anymore. So we have staff shortages. We are short. We, we were 68 positions short, now we're 50 positions short. And I'm saying all that to say this, in order to serve and protect the people, we got to have people to do that. And right now, we just don't have as many people as we would love to have, nor do we have the amount of people that we would have, we would have all over the county at one time. So we do, uh, we do provide services. We are a full service sheriff's office. And just to give you a little bit of education on that, sheriff is responsible for the jail, the courts, and serving civil papers. So if we're short in those areas, then we got to pull more people off the streets to cover those areas. So there, again, opens up opportunities for crime to occur on your properties, on your person. You know, So we do have to keep in mind when we are building all these things that we invite people in. We want the revenue. We want the people to come to this community. But the, as the population grows, the crime rate will go up. It's just how it is. There's no rhyme, no reason for that. But that's just how it is. That's the trend that we've been seeing. You know. So, but as it relates to the HOA, we do not enforce the rules for the HOA. That is something that the HOA and code, code enforcement have to work on together. However, if there is a crime committed in that particular subdivision or apartment complex or whatever it may be, we will respond to those. We do try to provide services such as jumping off cars, uh, domestic escorts, and that's 24 hours a day, you know, uh, seven days a week. We are uh, uh, unlocking cars, you know, but again, with the shortage of people, sometimes we may not be able to do all of these things, you know. Uh, one thing I will bring to light, if you don't have it in your subdivision, is and it's helped us a great deal with what we do. It's called a flock camera, F-L-O-C-K flock camera. Now, some businesses and subdivisions already have these in play. And what this is, is a tag reader. So in most places, they got one coming in and one going out. Well, how that works, it reads that tag. So if it's, that car was in a, in a crime, if it, that car was in the commission of a crime, it reads that tag. That tag is stolen. If that car is stolen, it reads that tag and it reports it to us so that we can get on top of it right away. Flock has helped us out a great deal and we recently put some more around the county and we're looking to put more in other places. But one thing that it really has helped us with is, again, identifying people so that we can, and, and Flock is all over. It's not just here local, it goes all over, you know, so we can find some. We found people in Mobile, Alabama one time, you know, that committed a crime and fled, you know. And through that flock camera, we were able to trace him and track him and get him back and bring him to justice. Uh, the flock cameras in your neighborhoods are vital to protecting your, your properties. Now, one other thing I will say is we have a lot of entering autos, and that has been a big problem. And we've had that, and it's continued to trend in the, in the northern, it's, it's continuing to trend so that we can go excuse me, it's continuing to trend upwards. In other words, there's more and more of them uh, occurring. So one thing I will tell you is just to lock your doors. Tell your people, put out some stuff on your bulletin boards, in your newsletters, whatever it is that you have. Lock your doors. Take your valuables out because there are so many things that are coming out. And you will be surprised. They leave guns. They leave wallets, purse, credit cards. And these people don't care. If it looks that like they can make some money off of it, they're going in there and get it if it's available. It's different today. People just <laughs> don't care about anyone. They don't respect anyone else's property. So what they want to do is just make the quick dollar. And how they do that is stealing from you. So 
if you're not going to take your stuff out, at least lock the door. Get it out of plain sight so that they won't get to see it. So, and again, uh, I won't <laughs> keep you for the whole 15 minutes. As you know, crime is what it is. You know, people are, you know, you're going to have crime in the world. And in order to fight that crime, we got to have people, you know. But in, in one thing I would offer, and I can't stress it enough, is those flock cameras. I'm not trying to sell, I'm not a representative of flock, but I can tell you it has helped us solving some crimes. And that is a really, really great tool for you to have in your subdivisions. Commissioner Robinson. Right. All right, real quick. So any um, stats you can share, because sometimes our citizens ask for, you know, they talk about the, the, big, the big seven sins and stuff. And, you know, we, we are evolving. I was sharing earlier, I've been here in 1990, you were here before me, but we've evolved. We're becoming more dense. Um, it, we're, we're no longer just a rural county. There's just, you know, country with cows. It, it, it's becoming denser, and with that comes what it comes. Um, we're, we're, not, we, we're not Atlanta, uh, but yet we, we're close enough, we're, we're evolving, we're becoming harder. It's not as it's, it's slow as it once was. So how are we doing? Are we double digits yet on murders? Let's just read the statistics. For this year? Yeah. No, sir, we aren't, actually. Uh, Good. Right now, through August, we have three, and some of these have committed in the city, so we won't include those. I but see. Yeah, 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 but yeah. Uh, This year, through August the 15th, we got three three homicides, you know. Uh, another one, rape, we got four. Aggravated assaults through a August 15th, 76. Robberies, 12. Burglaries, 102. Entering autos, 169. Auto theft, 104. Larcenies, which is theft, 349. And, and arson. Now, we got two arsons, all right, but compared to last year, we had six homicides in 2021. 29 uh, rapes, 114 aggravated assaults, 19 robberies, 165 burglaries, 212 entering autos, 173 auto thefts, 661 larceny cases, and again, we're still at two from last year for arson. You know, so some of these do go up, some of them are going down, and that's due to people being at work, working at home now. Uh, COVID changed the working environment where a lot of people can work at home, so that takes away the opportunities for people to go and commit crimes at your home. Yet, other places such as like when you do go back to work and with school going back in, people aren't at home as much, and you're entering autos, you got your, your stuff exposed all over the place, and they're just going, while you're working or while you're doing whatever it is you do, they're on the prowl. And so we got to be vigilant in doing that locking our stuff up and, and doing better by not giving them the opportunity or giving them an easy thing to get to, easy targets. There you go. So, so to that point, so um, Douglas County is the 12th most populous county in the state. There's 159 counties, we're number 12. Uh, number one through 11, all of them are 200,000 people plus. We're 147. So we're next up, but we're not quite a large county. More than 200 is a large county. But we're the eighth most dense. That means we're up on top of each other. But if you look at the numbers, though, you guys are doing a great job comparison. I mean, I was waiting for you to say double digit, like, well, that's not bad. It's, you're holding with, with not enough people. I get it. Douglas County has his reputation. Don't bring that over here. <laughs> don't, don't bring that over here. <laughs> you, you, you need to behave. And you know, I, I get it, you know, respectfully, you know. But that's important. Uh, we, we do fund, at least I, I'll speak for myself, I do fund public safety. I, I don't back off. I'm solid about that. Um, to give them what they need because we all want to be protected. We all like, you know, they do stuff that I don't do. I can't do that, but I, I have to respect that and ensure they can do the things that, 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 we, that keeps us safe at night. So, no, I mean, I know you don't have to go long. I, I know what um, public but safety is if about. I, if I can, I will. Yeah, have one go ahead. Thing. Wait in, sir. Uh, to say, that, say this, we can't do any of this without our Board of Commissioners, first off, and we appreciate everything that you do for us. But also, in, in the words of Sheriff Pounds, what he would say, is we can't do this without you. Right. And this is the people that represent the communities in the HOAs. So if you see something, say something. A lot of people look, well, that's not my place to say it. But if, if you keep having that attitude, more and more things are going to happen. People don't want to be snitches. I get it. Whatever. But still, in order for us to be able to be successful, we need your help, too. 
We need to be one with the community in order for us to be successful and do our jobs. Yes, we are doing a good job with what we do have. We are doing more with less, but we can have so much more help with the people in the community. And that, that's what we need you for. And we really appreciate what you have done so far. I know there's a distaste for law enforcement in this community and across the nation. But I challenge you to come up there and cause the sheriff is transparent. He's going to show you what's really going on. Come and do a ride along. Uh, uh, attend the Citizen Law Enforcement Academy so you can see what we do, why we do what we do, and how we do it before you just say, I'm not going to say anything to them. Please, I invite you to do that. And that's all I got, sir. No, yes, I, yes, sir. Yeah, let's speak questions. Okay, uh, guns is my topic as a homeowner and protecting my property. Um, when, when am I authorized to shoot? I understand if, I, if when you've broken into my, in, you know, you've crossed into my home, I can shoot. But when you talk about seeing people playing at your car door, like, like you know, like if uh, we will assume they're trying to break into your car, uh, is a homeowner authorized to shoot based on that being their property and on their property, or am I at risk? I will tell you like this, sir. I would be, first thing I do is I'll, I'll call 911 first off, because you never know what they have either. And if you go out there, what happens if you miss? What if it's your wife that's, or, your, or your kids or whatever the case may be? and they fire back on you, and then now you got a homicide as well as, you know, so I would try to handle this the most civil way and the most, the, the one that's gonna have the least harm, and I would call 911. But if you gotta protect your home, sir, protect your home and your family. You have every right to do that. You have every right to do that. It's your property, sir. Don't, don't get boxed. All right, any other questions? We have one question online yeah. from Commissioner Carthen. Commissioner, all right, read it for her. Does ring cameras help the sheriff's office with combating crime, and can we connect the sheriff's office to our ring cameras, or how does that work? We do, we do use ring cameras as well. You know, a lot of those crimes, and I'll, uh, I got a couple of guys back here, that's Deputy Sagos, and that's First Lieutenant John Jewell back there, and uh, they actually patrol the streets, and they could probably answer that question better for you, but yes, we have, with the ring cameras, when people, you can see the crimes going on right there on the ring camera. And a, lot, and a lot of people say, hey, come in. They'll invite you in to, yes, come look at the ring camera. And that does help us out a lot. Yeah, it does. It does. Yes, yes. ma'am. Have you seen an influx? I know it was a, it was a big thing um, many years ago with neighborhood watch groups. Have you found, um, has Douglas County found more opportunities as more HOAs are coming prevalent or just new communities are signing on? Are you guys helping assist with those neighborhood watch programs or is that even still so a thing? That's a part of our scope program. That's the Sheriff's Community Outreach Program and Education. And what they do is they go out throughout neighborhoods and they put up all a sign in every neighborhood so that they know that this is the neighborhood, this does have a neighborhood watch. Yes, and uh, Captain Elmer Horn is in, in charge of that, and he has been going out through the community and talking with them, Deputy Mark Matthews as well. So they have been going out, and it, and, and it helps, you know, but, and they go to different HOA meetings and all this and that too, you know, so. Yes, ma'am. Captain Elmer, like Elmer Fudd, Horn, H-O-R-N, H-O-R-N. Yes, sir. I don't want to uh, say anything against what the sheriff said, but he locks people up. I'm a criminal defense attorney. Don't shoot. Hey, look, if they are at your car, uh, you want to uh, carefully address that situation. And what he said is right. Call 911 first. Um, but, you know, uh, you do not want to be facing a murder charge trying to prove that what you did was right. And typically you want to have some type of reasonable force. If they don't have a gun on them and you're not going to know whether they have a gun on them or not, you might be in a little bit of trouble. So um, 
Now, if they're in your house, that's a whole different scenario, right? If they're in your, if they're coming in your house, absolutely. But if they're out of the car trying to break in the car, as a criminal defense attorney, I would advise you against that. Now, you know, I can't control what Douglas County Sheriff's Office does or whatever, but they are the ones that would potentially be called out to arrest you, right? So just be mindful of that. Uh, if they're outside, let them stay outside. You on the inside, don't let them come in. Thank you. Yes, sir. The second law cameras, uh, those funded through HOA? I'm sorry. Yes, the flood cameras, are they funded through HOA or is it by a grant? No, sir, that will be funded by the HOA. And they do have, uh, they got different cameras. They got one that's like a live time camera that's gonna be the best option, I would say, you know, because we can, we can find out what's going on in real time, you know what I'm saying? And we can, we got a timestamp on it and all this stuff. So yes, sir, that'll be something that the HOA will have to do. There's not a grant, I think it's like, 2400 bucks for uh, annually, like $350 installation fee. But you, you look at 2500, 2400 bucks annually to keep your stuff safe. Yep. Keep you safe, you're right, you know, so. Very good. Any other questions? Good. All right, guys, we're gonna keep this moving. Let's give Lieutenant Colonel Pounds a hand clap for that. Thank you, sir. All right, guys, we have got two more speakers real quick. Um, the next one is just a highlight um, about some of the activities that Douglas County is doing with your tax dollars. Mr. David Good is going to come up, and then we've got one guest speaker um, from Senator James's office going to come right behind that, and we're going to close y'all out. So let's just keep this moving. Ivy. David Good, his over 20 years of experience, he has served as president of a media group, publishing consultant, public relations director, senior book editor, etc. Among other opportunities, David currently serves as a communication director for the 2016 SPLOS program in Douglas County. Here he communicates about the program and its opportunities through media, press releases, elected officials, citizens, corporations, business owners, contractors, government organizations, and other stakeholders. Through his leadership experience and networking, Mr. Good has developed a strong relationships with elected officials and civic, faith-based, legal, and community leaders. David is routinely called upon his political and community knowledge base and communication style. Please welcome David Good. All right. <laughs> Mr. Good, welcome. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. And also I want to give a special shout out to our communications team for actually uh, broadcasting this. Ms. I Ms. Ivy Wright to ma making sure that we are on task and definitely to uh, Ms. Justine Hayward for her innovation and uh, dedication to the county. Thank you. Now let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm here, make sure that's the right one. There should have been another, uh, that was the slide that I actually sent you guys. Okay, but we'll go from this one. So this is on becoming a DBE, so I want to first um, give you guys some information about that one. Um, first of all, uh, becoming a DBE is very important when it comes to uh, Douglas County. It's very important when it comes to your SPLOS dollars because what happens is that you want to have vendors type people in your community. So as you end up doing that, you're building upon your business, you're building upon becoming a, uh, a vendor in Douglas County. You guys are given a card that says purchasing. Make sure that you go to the purchasing website and actually learn how to become a vendor in Douglas County. Becoming a vendor in Douglas County is totally separate from becoming a vendor in the city of Douglasville. You have to go to both government agencies to do that. Same thing with WSA. Um, the good thing now is that because during this plus period of time, we started focusing and seeing what we can do uh, when it came to having minority and DBE businesses um, coming in. You also can end up going to um, CEI's website and actually checking in and finding out what qualifies being a DBE. You could be a large firm that's minority, but because of your, uh, your own wealth or because your business is wealth, you end up going, uh, you no longer be a DBE, but you could be a minority business. Um, next, going into, uh, this is going to finish up my part of the slide presentation, but what I want to show you guys is that you are given uh, one of these cards that talks about your strategic priorities. Uh, when it comes to SPLOS, we actually had 
first up was public safety. Um, right now that's 32 percent and the current SPLOS, which is called the 2016 SPLOS, is going to end come um, April of 2023. So right now public safety portion only is funding uh, fire, EMS, and a digital radio system. So how is that, why is SPLOS important to HOAs? Well, one part of it is that if you live in a community and you're close to a fire station, meaning if you're over here on Riverside, you're not only close to fire station number six, but there's a brand new fire station being built for Bay um, that's going to be out on Douglas Boulevard and um, SR6. So that's important to your property value. That's important to your life because police and fire come out there to first what take care of your life, second is to take care of your property. And then so if you're in that area, your property value goes up, especially having two fire stations um, near you. Now, the second priority uh, was basically infrastructure and the third was economic development. Put those two together, what does that mean? Transportation. So if you remember the flood back in 2009, um, the Whitestone culvert was wiped out over there in District 4. Your spots dollars helped to build a new culvert. Um, in this area, you go up and down uh, Riverside, a young lady was actually killed, you know, coming from work, you know, real early in the morning, killed by 18-wheeler. Therefore, we started going up and making sure we had street lights. When it comes to a third part, which is the parks and rec, 17%, it was at a HOA that you guys said, hey, we need a senior center. It was at a HOA that you guys came out and said, we need a multi-purpose center, some place for our seniors to go, some place for our young people to go. And you want to make sure you live in a live, work, uh, play area. So therefore, your HOA dues, you come in and say, well, what, you know, what are the amenities around here? Well, you can always invite a commissioner to your HOA. Did you guys know that there are more than 900 neighborhoods in Douglas County? That means that there's 900 areas that you guys actually can impact just with your voice. There are roads all throughout the county. They need to be resurfaced. This current spot did $3 million per year for resurfacing. This last year, we are, I believe it's $9.8 million is being put towards resurfacing. Over, um, Commissioner Robinson wanted to make sure there was a certain amount that went to subdivisions. Usually subdivisions aren't covered by thoroughfare um, type of uh, resurfacing. They're usually covered by um, your internal, meaning that our DCDOT would take care of the um, internal, the thoroughfare for, uh, for the SPLOS would take care of those longer roads. But now we're into a point of saying, you say, hey, it's important for our roads to be taken care of. So we're making sure that we put a vast amount of money into that. You guys said that it's important for our police and our fire to be able to talk to each other. There's a fire on I-20 or there's something that's going on that's close to the county line where multiple jurisdictions are called in. They have to be able to talk to each other. We spent over $15.3 million on a digital radio system just to make sure, because it's got to be a headache that um, you know, Lieutenant Pounds is over, Lieutenant Colonel Pounds is over here trying to talk to, the, uh, try and talk to someone out there in Cobb County because there's a fire near there and they have to get things set up. If they can't talk to you, he got to switch a different frequency just to talk to them. That takes time, lives can be lost during that period of time. So that was very important, not to just you, but to the Board of Commissioners to make, make sure that happened. So as you travel throughout the county, make sure that you guys look at roads and look at anything that you feel that needs to happen because you can always contact your Board of Commissioners. Um, the commissioner that's here right now, um, Commissioner Robinson, he sits on the Transportation Committee. You know, let him know that this is going on. Ivy will make sure that it's, you know, he, he keeps him abreast about it. Same thing when you, um, I believe Commissioner um, Carthen is still on the call. She deals, she's over the Purchasing Oversight Committee. There are many things that you have to be able to do to get things purchased out. We have to make sure that vendors are doing their jobs, making sure they're going out there, be, making sure they're going out there, again, make sure they have DBEs on their team. Why is that important? Because you guys said it's important. You want local, those who belong to the chamber, to get on these um, different uh, projects. Our largest project to date right now is the widening of Lee Road. Um, that's very important to every commissioner because it's going to, at some point in time, impact every district. The, le the final part of it is supposed to go from 78 all the way over there to the Bright Star Connector. That's going to be the finalization of this wow, it's going to go right outside of this plus. So please make sure that you do these things. Right now, there is a group, I believe it's called CMES. They are large, they're a minority firm here in Douglas County. 
and they received, I believe, about $19 million in order to start working on the Lero widening. That's the largest amount that went out to a single company, and that company is a minority-owned company. So you see that our push for DBEs, they help um, this happen. So with that, I don't want to take much, too much time. They're, we can end up going through a Q&A session. Or, or if there's any questions, then I invite Commissioner Robinson to uh, respond and go from there. Um, and I believe I saw a question for the yeah. blue and black. Yeah, I, can you repeat the part about the uh, who's over the purchasing with the um, DMB? Say that again? Who's over the purchasing with the DMB? Um, the, the purchasing. Um, the purchasing director is Latanya Amons. Um, she's the one that whenever you go in there, you try and become a business. If you're a business owner and you're trying to become a vendor, that's the office you contact. You can definitely let her know, like, hey, I'm interested in becoming a DBE. Don't let anyone charge you for getting your certifications. Becoming a DBE is free. That means then that's, in, that's a disenfranchised business enterprise. Uh, you just end up looking at the qualifications. You have to meet certain criteria to be a DBE, uh, as well as financial, like I mentioned before. If you think about H.J. Russell, they are a large minority-owned company, but they cannot be a DBE because their personal wealth or their business wealth is over a certain amount. So therefore, when you go in there, please make sure you understand exactly what you need to become certified and how to become certified. Some companies become self-certified. That does not help you if there's nothing from the SBA or whoever they look at to, you know, basically find out if you truly are a minority-owned company. Yes, sir. The expansion that's going on on Lee Road, was that part of the splash from 2016? Uh, yes, the, the part going from, um, basically from the I-20 bridge going south over to, um, to SR-92, that's part of the, um, that's part of the splash. Now, if you remember early on, the, splot, the Lee Road widening piece, the Lee Road whole thing is basically about four different sections. Um, part one was supposed to take you from I-20 to 78. Part two was going to be the bridge. Part three is where we are now. But because of some issues with environmental, you could not do the 78 portion first. So we built, built the bridge first, then we end up getting the um, the right of way done for the widening, and then we did the widening under this uh, this plus. We also did a resurfacing of Lee Road as well because it was so bad. The citizens, even in HOA, said, "Well, can you go ahead and at least resurface our road?" Even though we know our project's coming later, but it's costing us too much to repair our cars. So, Commissioner Robinson, as well as other commissioners, came in and said, "Well, let's, at least we can do is pave the road now, and then when it's time to widen it, then we'll widen it." Any other questions? I'm, I'm going to add to that, and I appreciate it. Um, um, when, when, when will this splash be over with, Mr. Uh, this splash will be, our last month of collection will be March of 2023. So this splash will end then, but guess what? We'll still have this project um, going on because the new fire station will not be finished being built by the time the splash runs out, but the funds will still be there. Okay, so 2023, April, and so... Um, the Board of Commissioners just recently agreed uh, to put um, on this coming fall's referendum to extend this. We've shown over the past five years, going into six years, that it's been faithful. How many projects, David, total? Uh, right now, we have 63 projects that were completed, and we're working on 24 projects. And guess what? 20, one of those 24 projects have minority or DBE participation. And, and I, I bring this up because this is important. Again, I use this as a platform, the HOAs to communicate. Right. There's, I got 35. Commissioner Arrington, is he still here? Yeah. Commissioner Arrington, how many citizens are in Fulton County? Uh, about 1.2 million. All right. And how big is your district? My district is about 175,000 people. All right. So he, he's bigger than our whole county. I'm, I'm giving you all context. All right, so over, and again, we'll never be the big five, but we can hold our own, right? We, we, Randy and Janet Jackson, as I tell Madam Chair, let's just, we hold our own. But if you think about it, Douglas County is something that, um, it takes money. Um, David, how much did this generate, 160 million? How much did this process generate? Uh, right generate? now, we're, um, we're tasked to be about 173. We thought 147, but we, uh, we are now looking at 173. Right, so we, go on. Million. 1990, I moved in here, straight out of school with a roommate. So look at, look at it, 30, 30 years, a mortgage. I've watched this evolve. Things have um, dilapidated. 
right? I mean, in 2009, we built what? Uh, we had a SPLOS. We had one in 2002, but we built the aquatic center. We had one in 2009, and we built a jail. I gotta say this, $150 million, and it took everything. Cities didn't get anything, a single source project. All right, we needed it, got it. Okay, I'm not gonna get into that, that that's not my point. But the point is, that, that stuff is, public safety is expensive. All right, so 16 wrote it here, and then, now we got that out the way. What about everybody else? What about the other things in the county? So you guys blessed us in 2016 to go do these four categories of things as far as we talked about parks and rec, um, the E91, and all the other things that was on the list. So now, because again, what has happened, this thing has aged out, y'all. If you came in the 90s, you bought my age, fit something, you, came, you built your house in the 90s, the roads have dilapidated, it's old, right? In other words, so that's why Brookmont, Mount Vernon, and, and Greythorn in my, my district are like, no, y'all need to get y'all subdivision re resurfaced. I took all the allocation I had and put it all in there. No more main streets, because we're always doing the main streets. But what about your subdivision? So it's about recalibrating, right? You gotta re re reposition policy, right? You gotta shift it. Do you actually see the citizens? When you pull out your road, I mean, you gotta manicure your grass. Y'all are held to a standard, but I can't pave your road. Your grass looks nice, but your road tore up. It's beautiful. And so one of the things is that, are we that in tune to our citizens? And that's what this forum is about, to really listen to you. Like, all right, guys, we got this. And so again, to resurface um, um, that same amount of that jail, $150 million, I could have resurfaced all 773 center miles in this entire county. It's that much concrete. I could have repaid all 773 center miles. Public safety and transportation are expensive. Those really should be two different funding mechanisms. I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna keep them separate because we could have done a T-spot, but right now, it is what it is. You have to prioritize based on the hand that you have. But I gotta educate you guys so you see what the trade-offs are when we make our decisions. These are the trade-offs. Well, we're well, we gonna have to hold off. And we'll be like, well, when y'all gonna do my role? When you gonna do my subdivision? Well, I got 254 in my district alone. I only can do three. It's gonna be a minute. Unless we have other funding mechanisms like a T-SPLOS. So anyway, I, I want to just thank you, Dave, for that. I got to keep going. We got one more speaker that's going to come up and stuff. So guys, let's give Dave, Dave a good hand clap. Thank you very much. <laughs> keep going. All right. Real quick, we're at the end. We had, um, you know, earlier in our panel, I want to acknowledge Leslie Chu. He um, fell ill a little bit earlier today. He could not speak. So he's um, West Georgia Realtors president to come speak, uh, Mr. Gregory Wallace. We appreciated his contribution. Likewise, my, my, my senator, from the 35th district, um, Donzella Jays could not be here today um, at the last minute and stuff. So she sent her representative, her chief of staff, um, Dory Henry, to bring greetings and, and, and close us out. So guys, let's give her a hand clap as she brings the message from our senator from the 35th district. Thank you, Commissioner Robinson. Uh, first of all, I'll bring you greetings. My name is Dory Henry. I'm the chief of staff of State Senator Donzella James. She represents um, Douglas County and Fulton County in District 35. She could not be here with us today. She has bronchitis and can't talk. And any of you all who know Senator James, you know she likes to talk. So she sent me instead. Um, thank you, Commissioner Robinson, for holding this event. I know you yes. have it several times during the year. And thank you, Commissioner Arrington, for your insight and all of your information. Um, knowing that HOAs are supposed to be a benefit for the homeowners, that's the pro side of it. In the Senate office, we hear the con side. You know, there's pros and cons of everything. We get all of the complaints from the homeowners on what the HOA is not doing. Um, because of COVID-19, um, knowing that people lost their jobs, um, they didn't have any, you know, the funding was scarce, and even though they were still making their mortgage payments, a lot of us, some people did not pay their HOA fee. So that causes a problem for those associations. Um, and sometimes we know HOAs don't always do what they're supposed to do. You know, they promise us pools, they promise us clubhouses, they promise us um, tennis courts, and those things never come to fruition. And there's really not anything that the homeowner can do about the HOA not providing the, the services that, they, that we sign on to when we sign our um, closing documents when we purchase those homes. Um, but if we pay our homeowners association fees, uh, they're filing suits and lawsuits against us. 
they want to foreclose on your home, and if they foreclose on your home, then your home is getting sold up underneath you, and sometimes we don't even know that. Your, your home has been foreclosed on. So having said that, Senator James, this past legislative session, passed a piece of legislation in the form of a resolution. It's Senate Resolution 615, and that created a Property Owners Association, Homeowners Association, and Condominium Association study. study is designed to do is for homeowners, like all of you in the room, and even the homeowners association to come to the table and let's talk about those issues that we have in our communities and, and hopefully pass a piece of legislation that's going to protect the homeowner. Um, how the study committees works is the lieutenant governor assigns specific state senate, because it's a senate co uh, study committee, senate's, uh, specific senators to each study committee, and there's about five of them, five or six. Well, the lieutenant governor hasn't made those appointments yet to our study committee. So I'm here to ask you all, if you're interested, and we want you to be a part of that group, to reach out to the Lieutenant Governor's office. Let me give you his phone number. Uh, that's Lieutenant Governor Jeff Dun Duncan. His name is spelled with a G, G-E-O-F-F, -F, as in Frank Duncan. The phone number is 404-656-5030. And his email address is Jeff, G-E-O-F-F, -F, dot Duncan at L-T-G-O-V, like Lieutenant Governor, dot G-A dot G-O-V. We're asking you all to call his office, uh, send emails to his office, encouraging him, urging him to make appointments to that study committee as soon as possible so we can move forward and help you all resolve your issues. We have one of our constituents who's been having an issue with his homeowners association for over three years. They owed him some specific repairs and they have not done that. And so they were trying to put him out of his house for him not paying his homeowners association uh, dues. So we're just trying to get some parity and making sure that even though we sign a contract when we um, buy our homes, they, it offers them certain rights and it offers us certain rights that we wanna make sure that our rights don't get taken advantage of. Email address again for the Lieutenant Governor is G-E-O-F-F, -F, G is in George, E is in Edward, O is in Oscar, F-F -F is in Frank two times, dot Duncan, D as in David, U-N as in Nancy, C-A-N as in Nancy, at L-T, L as in Larry, T as in Tom, G-O-V dot G-A dot G-O-V. If you need to get in touch with us, our office number is 404-463-1379. If you need to get a hold of Senator James directly, you can call me. My number is 470-418-2036. Again, my name is Dory Henry, D-O-R-E-E-H-E-N-R-Y. And my email address is Dory Henry, that's my name, at gmail.com. Chief of Staff for State Senator Donzella Dames, James, District 35. Thank you for having me. If you have any questions, I'm willing to take them. Yes, sir. The purpose of the study again? The purpose of the study committee is to ensure, and this is what the legal terminology says, property owners associations, homeowners associations, and condominium associations. Oh, do, 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 the wrong thing. It's really to have the conversation between the homeowners and the association, um, homeowners associations, to come up with some law. If we need to pass legislation that, that um, covers the homeowners, we're willing to do that because it just seems like there's not any parity when it comes to um, the disparities on whether the homeowners associations are supposed to deliver services, the homeowners are not receiving those services, and then they're um, disproportionately and being removed from their properties 
without any recourse or um, any type of protection. You. You're welcome. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Yes. Any, any more questions? You got, you got a question? I've spoken with Senator James in reference to this, in reference to the study committee, so I'm glad to see you all having some traction. Yes. Very good. And I have to say, to get anything passed at the state legislature uh, when you're a Democrat is very, very challenging because we are in the minority. One thing I can say for Senator James, and I'm not just saying this because I work for her, but she has very good relationships across the aisle. She's the only black female that ha is a chairperson of a committee um, at the state capitol. There's 55, uh, on, as far as black legislators and Democrats, there's 55 state uh, senators out of those. There's 23 of those that look like us and are Democrats. And on the House side, there's 180 House representatives. But total, there's 65 African-American um, state House uh, representatives and senators combined. But it's just not enough for us to pass legislation. So you, if you don't have those um, relationships with those other people, <laughs> then it's really hard to get anything done. So Senator James has been trying to get this study committee passed, I want to say for about five years now. This is an election year that has a lot to do with how p legislation moves down at the Capitol. So she was able to get it passed and thank God. So you guys please come and support her and whatever your issues are, whatever we can do to help, we're here to help you. Thank, thank you. you so much. All right, let's give her a hand clap, please. Thank you so much, Madam Henry. And, and I, I get it, I get what it takes to get stuff down at the Capitol. Um, you know, I, my first two terms, I was in a minority and the second two, I'm in a majority. I like the majority better. Uh, we can get stuff done, but, but thank you so much for those comments. Guys, we're gonna have to close this out. We can stay for Q&A, but I've got to my citizens that's online, thank you so much for coming out to the sixth annual mental health forum. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> I'm already on to my next one. Um, HOA boot camp forum. Um, this is a very important event that we had. Um, again, a lot of good topics to my, my panelists. Thank you so much for being here. Um, again, we're going to have the seventh annual next time. Again, in August, we're going to continue this conversation. And we're making progress. Again, we showed you that we enacted, based on last year, we changed our code. Requiring requirements, requiring financials to be disclosed, elections being disclosed. Then with the Airbnb. So we do hear you. And we do take action. It's one thing to talk. It's one thing I've learned in 14 years. Like, I, I don't like to talk. I just get stuff done. Right, you, and to your point, you gotta build relationships. You gotta get to a majority, get to three, quit talking, quit studying, get something done. Show the citizens that you've got some action taken, they can hear you, they can see that fruit. They can see it. So that's how you judge um, real elected officials. It's about the fruit. So I thank you guys for coming out. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. I'm signing off, Kelly Robinson, District Two Vice Chair of Board of Commissioners. Thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry for the shout out late. Um, and all my fellow commissioners, Commissioner Mitchell and Ann Jones-Geyer. Thank you. Good day. Thanks. All right, guys.